Thomas Alive Today presents... Four Hours Long Dead Retail Documentaries Compilation Kmart, The Complete Story The giant Kmart Corporation grew from a Detroit Five and Dime store opened in 1899. Its proprietor was Sebastian Sparing Kresge, a former Pennsylvania tinware salesman, who along with a partner, John McCrory, adopted the chain store idea first used by Frank W. Woolworth. When Kresge and McCrory dissolved the partnership, they had formed in 1897. McCrory took over the stores in Memphis, and Kresge maintained those in Detroit, forming S.S. Kresge Company. Kresge's eponymous outlet sold costume jewelry, housewares, and personal grooming aids. Its success encouraged him to open a second store in Port Huron, Michigan. The same year, others followed in rapid succession. By 1912, when Kresge incorporated his company in Delaware with a capitalization of $7 million, there were 85 stores producing annual sales of $10.3 million. Four years later he reincorporated in Michigan, this time with a $12 million capitalization. In 1918 the firm went public with a listing on the New York Stock Exchange. Always in high traffic, convenient locations, Kresge Red Front stores featured open displays of merchandise with items systematically associated. Following their founders' abhorrence of credit, they kept their prices to thrifty nickel and dime limits, until inflation after World War I made the cost of many items too high. Undaunted, Kresge opened a chain of green front units in 1920, all selling merchandise at prices ranging between 25 cents and $1. He also acquired Mount Clemens Pottery, to supply the stores with ever-popular inexpensive dinnerware. In 1924 the company's 257 stores generated annual sales of $90 million. Convinced this success should go hand-in-hand -hand with corporate responsibility toward the less fortunate, the company founder established the Kresge Foundation, making an initial contribution of $1.3 million plus securities worth $65 million. The following year Kresge resigned the presidency he had held since 1907 to concentrate on long-range goal setting as company chairman. His planning bore fruit in January 1929, when a Kresge store opened in the United States' first suburban shopping center, Country Club Plaza, in Kansas City, Missouri, thereby anticipating a shift in shopping patterns by some 15 years. Another long-range goal crystallized in September 1928, with the formation of a Canadian subsidiary that opened the country's first Kresge store the following May. Based in Kitchener, Ontario, the initial venture was so successful that the company's $5 million investment financed another 18 stores and locations from Winnipeg to Montreal by the end of 1929. These brought the total number of Kresge stores to 597, together yielding sales of $156.3 million. The company's orderly expansion changed after 1929, when the Depression-era stock market plunged the price of Kresge stock from $57.50 per share to an eventual low of $5.50. This was a severe blow to company management, which had pledged its support by taking turns to buy the deflated stock, gambling on its bottoming out at $26. Kresge found himself at a loss, having promised to buy 100,000 shares he could no longer afford, and the company took them off his hands. By 1936, however, the chairman had bought back at cost his own shares plus the 251,306 others owned by the management. The depression also brought falling sales as well as inventory losses through the failure of suppliers' businesses. Competition also increased, the scramble for the retail dollar-fueled rivalry from Sears, Roebuck and prompted other chains to open department store bargain basements. Forced to broaden its inventory to meet this threat, Kresge had to raise its prices, so that green front stores had many items selling for up to $3 despite their former $1 ceiling. With the depression over by 1940, there were 682 stores in 27 U.S. states, plus 61 in Canada. Together, the stores produced 1940 sales of $158.7 million. As the decade advanced, many homeowners moved out to the suburbs from inner-city locations, the retailers followed. Kresge management cautiously opened one suburban shopping center store in 1947, adding to the first one that had opened in 1929. Three more followed in 1948. By 1953 there were about 40 suburban stores in the United States, plus one in Canada. By the mid-1950s chairman Sebastian Kresge was long retired from active company management. An operating committee of 16 executives appointed by the board of directors steered the corporate strategy. 
Although the committee frequently combined smaller stores in high-volume areas to provide better selection and more efficient service, there were 616 U.S. stores by 1954, plus 74 in Canada. Many of the units featured modern conveniences such as air conditioning, self-service displays, and shopping baskets. All these operations combined to reach sales figures totaling $337.9 million in 1954 up from $223.2 million in 1945. Although the variety store image still guided company activities during the 1950s, pricing limits were fading away, with the concept of discount retailing coming to the fore in its stead. Kresge offered economical private label products ranging from clothing to house paint. The variety of brand name offerings also broadened to include electric appliances, radios, and lawnmowers. A wider variety of merchandise plus higher pricing brought a need for a layaway plan allowing customers to save for expensive items. It was, however, still against company policy to offer credit, although competitors were luring customers in this way. In 1959, coinciding with the opening of the first Kresge store in Puerto Rico, Harry Blair Cunningham succeeded to the presidency of SS Kresge Company. A former newspaper reporter, he had worked his way up from trainee status through the store manager ranks, eventually becoming general vice president. Twin assignments went with this position, one was to tour all of Kresge's U.S. stores, assessing the future position of the company and its competitors in the variety store industry, the other was to prepare himself for the company presidency, when Franklin Williams would retire in two years' time. Cunningham's travels convinced him that Kresge's competitors were not other variety chains, but the new discounters aiming for fast inventory turnover, which they could achieve by lower markups on a large assortment of small items. Discounting, in fact, was a return to Sebastian Kresge's basic merchandising philosophy, which would be a bulwark against competition in the future, just as it had been in the past. Cunningham, after a period of testing, concluded that higher sales volume, rather than higher markups, would boost the company's profits, which had dropped during the 1950s. In 1962 the company opened its first discount store in the Detroit suburb of Garden City, calling it Kmart. Within a year, there were 17 others. Unlike Kresge stores, Kmarts were not placed in shopping centers but were built in plazas by themselves, to avoid internal competition and also to provide ample parking. To ensure a 25% annual pre-tax return on investment, each store featured decor that was pleasant, though not extravagant, and each aimed for 8 inventory turnovers per year. The Kmart stores were an instant success. By 1963, there were 63 facilities, 51 of which provided repair and maintenance service for automobiles. Three years later, the number of Kmarts had swelled to 122. The Kmart introduction still left the company with a number of older Kresge stores, still on long leases, which were too small to display Kmart's expanded merchandise lines. Numerous Kresge stores, mostly in deteriorating business areas, were renamed Jupiter Discount Stores and converted to facilities offering a limited variety of low markup, fast-moving merchandise such as clothes, drugstore items, and housewares. By 1966 there were almost 100 Jupiter stores in operation. In 1965 the company underwent several changes. One involved the sale of longtime subsidiary Mount Clemens Pottery. Another was the acquisition of Holly Stores, a retailer of women's and children's clothing that had been a Kmart licensee since 1962, and was operating clothing departments in 124 Kmarts, Kresge's, and Jupiter's at the time of the acquisition. SS Kresge Company's sales for 1965 reached a record $851 million, representing a 23.6% gain from 1964. There were 895 stores, of which 108 were in Canada. Although discount retailing had gained momentum somewhat later in Canada than in the United States, the Canadian subsidiary had opened its first Kmart in London, Ontario, in 1963. At the same time, while inner-city deterioration in Canada had not reached the same level as in U.S. cities, the company turned some of its smaller, older Canadian stores into Jupiters. The successful Canadian operations made a large contribution to the total sales figures for 1966, which topped $1 billion for the first time, reflecting a 28% rise over 1965. Company founder Sebastian Kresge did not live to see this triumph. He died in September 1966 at the age of 99, having retired from the company chairmanship only three months earlier. Also in 1966, the famous blue light special was invented by a Kmart manager in Fort Wayne, Indiana, who was seeking a way to make it easier for his customers to find the Christmas wrapping paper that he was clearing. The blue light special went on to be adopted chainwide and become an American icon. 
Meantime, spurred by its Canadian success, the company found another international opportunity in Australia, via a joint venture, Kmart Australia Limited, with retailer GJ Coles & Coy, Limited. The 1968 undertaking, in which Kmart held 51% of the shares, produced five Australian Kmarts by 1970. By 1969 SS Kresge Company had decided against purchasing the licensee of its automotive departments, instead opening another subsidiary called Kmart Enterprises Incorporated, to operate the departments, now so popular that 56 had opened in that year alone. That year the number of company stores stood at 1,022, sales at $4.6 billion, and average profit per store at $42,358. In 1972 Cunningham was succeeded as chief executive by Robert E. Dewar, a former company lawyer and president since 1970. The presidency was filled by Irvin Wardlow, whose forte was merchandising. The three upper managers hurdled these challenges with strategies forged under Cunningham's tenure, such as the centralized buying for both Kresge and Kmart stores that reduced possible in-house conflict between variety store and discount divisions. Meticulous crafting of the training program guaranteed each store manager could make decisions about products, promotions, pricing, and locations to ensure the store's competitiveness. Other policies included limiting each store to one entrance and exit, thus reducing staff needs and escalating sales per employee, and designing smaller stores of 65,000 to 70,000 square feet, adequate for smaller, more affluent shopping communities. All of these changes gave the company a chance to upgrade merchandise while phasing out lease departments on all items except shoes. The course charted for the 1970s brought Kresge an annual sales growth of 22% from 1972 to 1976, with 1976 sales totaling $8.4 billion. The company, however, was not without its failures. A fast-food drive-in chain called Kmart Chef, set up in 1967, closed in 1974 after having peaked at just 11 units. The costly credit card operation, used by only 9% of Kmart's customers, was withdrawn the same year, while a $65 million purchase of planned marketing associates, an insurance company renamed Kmart Insurance Services Incorporated, brought a loss of $8 million in 1975, although a modest profit of $344,000 was recorded for 1976. By this time the company's 1,206 Kmarts were accounting for almost 95% of sales. For this reason, shareholders changed the company name to Kmart Corporation in 1977. The late 1970s saw changes in Kmart's seemingly impregnable position. New competitors with more inviting stores made company facilities seem shoddy, and specialty stores began to stock Kmart staples such as sports equipment, drugs, and personal grooming aids. Changes in public taste showed up in lagging profits, which sank 27% in 1980 on record sales reaching $14.2 billion. Other warning signals showed in plunging inventory turnover, which dropped from the 8 times annually level of the 1960s to 3s.8 times by 1979. Utility bills, wages, and other overhead costs soared because of inflation, but fierce competition prevented the company from raising its discount prices. Kmart responded by cutting the number of scheduled new stores in favor of remodeling existing units and restocking them with more fashionable merchandise. It also installed a computer system to handle inventories, orders, shipments, and other procedures that could speed up delivery times to each store. Other changes included the 1978 sale of the company's 51% interest in Kmart Australia Limited to GJ Coles & Coy for a 20% stake in GJ Coles & Coy, thus closing out Kmart's ownership of the Australian Kmart stores. Bernard M. Fauber succeeded Dewar as chairman and chief executive in 1980. In 1984 Kmart expanded its acquisition program and diversified into specialty markets. Because Kmart had already been experimenting with its home improvement departments, a logical move was the $88.2 million purchase of a nine-unit Texas chain called Home Centers of America Incorporated. Kmart made home centers operations into warehouse-type stores, changing the name to Builder Square. Next came Walden Books, costing $300 million for 845 stores that had produced sales of $417 million in 1983. An Oregon-based chain of 164 drugstores called Pay Less joined the growing lineup in 1985. There was another change in 1985 this one in Kmart strategy when apparel division president Joseph Antonini launched a new line of clothes named for and designed by actress Jacqueline Smith that helped turn apparel into the company's fastest growing business. By the time he succeeded to the company chairmanship in 1987, Antonini's strategy had added racing driver Mario Andretti to the list for automotive accessories promotions, Fuzzy Zoller for golf products, and domestic Doyen Martha Stewart for kitchen and housewares support. 
the celebrities helped the bottom line profits for 1987 rose 19% to reach $692 million on total sales of $25.6 billion. Other factors in year-end figures were the sale of all U.S. Kresge and Jupiter stores to McCrory Corporation, the $238 million sale of First Cafeterias and another cafeteria chain called Bishop Buffets Incorporated, to Cavalcade Foods Incorporated. New ventures in 1988 included a partnership with Bruno's Incorporated, a food retailer, which generated the American Fair hypermarket near Atlanta in 1989, purchase of a 51% ownership interest in Macro Incorporated, which operated membership warehouses, and launch of Office Square, a discount office supply chain. In 1989 Kmart acquired Pace Membership Warehouse Incorporated and the remaining 49% of Macro, converting Macro stores to Pace formats. It also opened Sports Giant, a group of sporting goods stores, and finished the year with sales of $27.7 billion and income of $800 million. The company changed its logo from red and turquoise to red and white, with Mart written within the larger K in 1990. Next came the acquisition of the Sports Authority into which it rolled the Sports Giant stores. Kmart also began a long overdue six-year overhaul of its stores to help shore up its image. By this time, Walmart had emerged as a credible threat and overtook Kmart in sales and market share in 1990. The following year, Kmart opened the first Super Kmart Center in Medina, Ohio, combining a full-service grocery store with the Kmart General Merchandise selection and opening 24 hours a day. Still believing diversification was a good investment, the company purchased a 21.6% interest in OfficeMax, an office supply chain, in 1990 then increased the stake to 90% in 1991. By 1992 Kmart was still in an acquisition mode, buying 13 stores in the Czech Republic and Slovakia's major department store chain, Borders Books Superstores as a complement to Walden Books, and Intelligent Electronics Bismarck chain. Sales for 1992 hit $34.6 million, a healthy notch above 1991's $32.5 billion, and Kmart's workforce reached an all-time high of 373,000. Realizing that Kmart's future lay in its core retail business, the company began shedding non-core assets and sprucing up its stores. In 1993 Kmart sold 91 of its 113 Pace membership warehouses to Walmart. In 1994 came the spin-off of Office Max and the Sports Authority, the sale of Payless Drug Stores and its 22% interest in Kohl's Meyer Limited, an alliance to open stores in Mexico and Singapore, and the launch of Kathy Ireland's apparel line. Sales for 1993 had hit a high of $37.7 billion with income of $941 million. Sales for 1994 fell to $34.6 billion but the big news was a staggering loss of $940 million. More serious than ever in its reorganization, Kmart's newest journey began with the appointment of Floyd Hall, former chairman of Target Stores, as president, CEO, and chairman of the board in June 1995. Next came the spin-off of the Borders, the sale of its remaining interest in Office Max and the Sports Authority, and the divestment of 860 auto service centers to the Penske Corporation with widespread rumors of bankruptcy, the downgrading of its rating, and analysts predicting Kmart's demise. Many wondered if the nearly 100-year-old retailer could survive increased competition from both Walmart's and Target's newer, snazzier stores. Hall set out to prove Kmart not only was not going under but had just begun to fight. After closing 214 stores, disposing of its Czech, Slovak, and Singapore properties, and pledging to reduce expenses by $600-$800 million, Kmart was ready to prove its retail metal. Its new merchandising credo centered around four simple words, brands, consumables, convenience, and culture. To help achieve its goals came a new advertising campaign featuring comedian Rosie O'Donnell and director Penny Marshall, a massive shake-up in upper management, and the launch of a multi-year $750 million remodeling program. The latter involved the introduction of the big Kmart format, which was cleaner and brighter and featured wider aisles for easier shopping. Other key changes were the addition of a section of consumable goods conveniently located near the front of the stores and an increased emphasis on the children's and home furnishings departments. By the end of 1998, 1,245 of the company's stores had been converted to the big Kmart format. Another important initiative was an expansion of popular brand name and private label lines, particularly the 1997 launch of the Martha Stewart Everyday line of bed and bath products through a strategic alliance between Kmart and Martha Stewart Living Omni Media LLC, which Stewart had formed earlier that year to oversee her growing empire. The Martha Stewart line was expanded to include garden and patio products as well as baby products in 1999, and that year the line generated more than $1 billion in sales. 
Also in 1997, Kmart announced the sale of its remaining interest in Thrifty Pay Less to Rite Aid, refinanced its debt load, started leasing out hundreds of its largest parking lots, and built a hip new three-story Kmart in Manhattan near Greenwich Village. The firm also sold its interest in its Mexican joint venture and sold Builders Square to Leonard Green and Partners for a mere $10 million. Further retrenchment came in February 1998 when Kmart sold its 112 stores in Canada to Hudson's Bay Company for $167.7 million. US dollars. Hall succeeded in saving Kmart from oblivion, and the firm returned to profitability in the fiscal year ending in January 1998, posting net income of $249 million on sales of $32.18 billion, and stayed in the black for the following two years. By 1999 Hall was confident enough of the company's future to announce plans to open 400 stores over the next five years, with half of the units to be Super Kmart centers. About 100 new stores were opened in 1999, the same year that Kmart ventured into e-commerce with the formation of BlueLight.com, a joint venture formed by Kmart, SoftBank Corporation, Yahoo Incorporated, and Martha Stewart Living Omni Media. Kmart also signed agreements in 1999 with Fleming Companies Incorporated and Super Value Incorporated to distribute grocery items to its stores. Despite this string of positive developments, underlying and significant problems remained, and Hall's expansion program quickly proved to be premature. Hall retired as chairman, president, and CEO in early 2000. Hired as the new chairman and CEO was 39-year-old Charles C. Chuck Conaway, who had been president and COO of CBS Corporation, the giant drugstore chain. Conaway moved quickly to implement major changes as Kmart's financial performance began to once again head south. He shook up senior management, announced that 72 underperforming stores would be closed, and launched a $1.7 billion program to improve the supply chain in an attempt to resolve the chain's chronic problem of keeping items in stock. The new initiatives continued in 2001. The company inked a deal with Fleming, making that firm the exclusive supplier of food and consumables for Kmarts and Super Kmarts. The Martha Stewart Everyday line was expanded even further, and an agreement was reached to develop a new and exclusive line of Disney children's clothing. Conaway brought back the Blue Light Special which had been shelved in 1991 in an attempt to instill some excitement into the stores, and prices were permanently trimmed on 38,000 everyday items in a new Blue Light Always pricing strategy. This last maneuver, an ill-advised attempt at beating Walmart at its own game that was launched in August 2001, proved to be a critical mistake. Not only did Walmart move quickly and ruthlessly to match or undercut the prices, but Kmart also compounded its mistake by simultaneously and drastically cutting back its distribution of expensive advertising circulars. Customers used to the circular simply stopped shopping at Kmart, and same-store sales fell throughout the final months of 2001, including during the crucial holiday selling season. The declining sales resulted in a liquidity crisis and halts in shipments from major vendors, leading the company to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection on January 22, 2002, becoming the largest retailer ever to do so. Just prior to the filing, James B. Adamson was named Kmart chairman, with Conaway remaining CEO. Adamson had been a Kmart director since 1996 and had previously served as chairman and CEO of Advanica Restaurant Group Incorporated, owner and operator of mid-price restaurant chains, such as Denny's. In March 2002 Conaway resigned and Adamson took on the position of CEO as well. That month, Kmart announced that it would close 284 underperforming stores, resulting in the elimination of 22,000 jobs and a charge of more than $1 billion. Many observers were doubtful that a major discount chain could find such a niche given the strengths of the two main rivals, Walmart with its rock-bottom prices and extensive grocery aisles and Target with its discount prices for slightly upscale products. In February 2002 Kmart launched a new advertising campaign featuring television commercials directed by Spike Lee and sporting a family values theme in the tagline Kmart. The Stuff of Life in a company press release, Stephen Fooling, a senior marketing vice president, said that Kmart's goal with this campaign is to build an emotional bond with the consumer by re-establishing the role Kmart plays in its shoppers' lives. After dismissing Conaway and Schwartz, Kmart closed more than 300 stores in the U.S., including all the Kmart stores in Alaska, and laid off around 34,000 workers as part of the restructuring process. Kmart introduced five prototype stores with a new logo, layout, and lime green and gray color scheme, one in White Lake, Michigan, and four in central Illinois. The new layout was touted as having wider aisles and improved selection in lighting, and the city or town's name was featured under the new Kmart logo at the front entrance. However, Kmart could not afford a full-scale rollout. 
The lime green prototype was abandoned for the new Kmart Orange concept that rolled out at several of its locations throughout the United States in 2006. While Kmart was going through bankruptcy, a significant amount of Kmart's outstanding debt was purchased by ESL Investments, a hedge fund controlled by Edward Lampert. Lampert worked to accelerate the bankruptcy process. On January 13, 2003, Kmart closed 326 stores due to a lack of profitability and poor sales. On May 6, 2003, Kmart emerged from bankruptcy protection as a subsidiary of the new Kmart Holding Corporation. On June 10, 2003, Kmart began trading on the Nasdaq stock market with the ticker symbol of KMRT with Lampert serving as the chairman and with ESL Investments controlling 53% of the new company for an investment of less than $1 billion. Lampert dismissed his concerns that the smaller company would be at a disadvantage, stating the focus that a lot of people have in retail revolves around sales, but sales without profit do not allow a business to be successful in the long term. He began to improve the company's balance sheet by reducing inventory, cutting costs, and closing underperforming stores. By the fourth quarter of 2003, Kmart posted its first profitable quarter in three years, although it has since returned to an operating loss. On July 23, 2004, a new Kmart logo featuring a large red K with Kmart in small block letters underneath it was announced. On August 12, 2004, Kmart and E! Entertainment Television announced a new, exclusive, cross-promotional clothing brand called Attention. Attention was launched as a new clothing brand that would be sold only at Kmart stores and would be used to promote E! News Live. Kmart had previously signed a similar deal with the WB Network to have the cast of five WB shows where Kmart branded clothing during shows. On November 17, 2004, Kmart's management announced its intention to purchase Sears for $11 billion. As part of the merger, the Kmart Holding Corporation would be transferred to the new Sears Holdings Corporation and Sears would be purchased by the new Sears Holdings Corporation. The new corporation announced that it would continue to operate stores under both the Sears and Kmart brands. Around this time, Kmart changed its logo from a red K with the script Mart inside, to the same K with the chain's name and lowercase letters below it. Kmart's headquarters were relocated to Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and in 2012 the sprawling headquarters complex in Troy, Michigan, was acquired by the Forbes Company, which owns the nearby upscale mall, Somerset Collection. No concrete plans for redevelopment of the site had been announced. In 2005, Sears Holdings Corporation introduced the Sears Essentials store format, which was supposed to be like a Sears and a Kmart store mixed together. Sears Essentials stores were freestanding stores. In 2006, the company discontinued the Sears Essentials name, and renamed all of the Sears Essentials stores as Sears Grand Stores. Kmart started remodeling stores to the orange prototype in 2005. In 2006, the typical white and blue interior of the stores was changed to orange and brown, and shelf heights were lowered to create better sight lines. The remodeled stores contain an appliance department with Kenmore appliances and most have hardware departments that sell craftsman tools, which prior to the merger had been exclusive to Sears stores. Some auto centers left vacant by Penske after Kmart filed for bankruptcy had been converted to Sears auto centers. As of 2009, 280 stores had been remodeled to this new prototype. In July 2009, Sears Holdings opened its first Sears-branded appliance store inside a Kmart. The 4,000-square-feet store within a store opened inside the former garden department of a Birmingham, Alabama, Kmart. It is two-thirds the size of the appliance department in most Sears stores, but larger than the 2,500-square-feet appliance department in remodeled Kmart stores. In October 2009, it was reported that Kmart and Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia failed to come to a new agreement. This came after Stewart made remarks on CNBC that her line at Kmart had deteriorated, particularly after the Sears merger. In November 2009, Kmart reported its first year-over-year -year sales increase of half a percent since 2005, and only the second such increase since 2001. On December 27, 2011, after a disastrous holiday sales season, Sears Holdings announced that 100 to 120 of Sears and Kmart stores would close. In 2014, news reports indicated that Kmart was liquidating dozens of stores across the United States. Kmart's parent company, Sears Holdings Corporation, underwent financial distress throughout the year, sparking an unspecified number of closings of Sears and Kmart locations amid vendors and lenders' concerns about its liquidity. Along with store closings, measures included the spinning off its lands and division, selling most of its stake in Sears Canada, issuing debt and taking on loans that cumulatively put it on track to raise $1.445 billion in cash in 2014. 
Howard Reeves, a company spokesman who has often spoken on behalf of Kmart, said, store closures are part of a series of actions we're taking to reduce ongoing expenses, adjust our asset base and accelerate the transformation of our business model. In April 2016, Kmart announced that it was liquidating 68 stores. The chain announced in September 2016 that 64 more stores in 28 states would close by mid-December 2016. Sears Holdings CEO Eddie Lampert stated in October 2016 that there were not and never have been plans to close the Kmart format and that they are working hard to make it a more fun, engaging place to shop, powered by our integrated retail innovations and shop your way. In December 2016, at least 25 Kmart locations were targeted for closure in early 2017. In January 2017, Kmart announced that 78 more stores would close, including the first Kmart location in Garden City, Michigan. In May 2017, Kmart announced the upcoming closure of 18 more stores. Sears Holdings admitted uncertainty regarding the survival of both Sears and Kmart. In early June 2017, Kmart announced that an additional 49 stores across the U.S. were to be shuttered by September 2017. In early July 2017, Kmart had announced that 35 more stores would close by early October 2017. In late August 2017, Kmart announced another 28 store closures, including the last Rhode Island location, in Cranston. On October 17, 2017, Kmart announced the liquidation of an unspecified number of locations by late November. On November 3, 2017, it was announced that a further 45 Kmarts were to close, effective by January 2018, including Kmart's last store in Alabama, in Albertville. On January 4, 2018, after yet another disappointing holiday sales season, Kmart announced the liquidation of 64 more stores in the spring of 2018. This included Kmart's only remaining Super Kmart location in Warren, Ohio, which officially discontinued the Super Kmart format. According to MSN Money, Kmart along with sister company Sears had an extremely high chance of disappearing and going defunct in 2018, such that 2017 would have marked its final holiday season as an independent brand. On March 15, 2018, Sears Holdings announced that a small profit was made in the fourth quarter of 2017. However, investors claimed that it was due to tax refunds and that sales were still falling for both Kmart and Sears. On March 26, 2018, CEO Eddie Lampert said, I'm not sure Kmart on its own could ever be a great retailer, implying that the company was trying to shift to online shopping as opposed to brick-and-mortar stores. On April 12, 2018, Sears announced plans to close and auction 16 of its Sears stores, and close several more Kmart locations, but did not specify how many. Two known locations on the list were Kmart stores in Brandon, Florida, and Saugus, Massachusetts. In early May, Sears announced the liquidation of several more Kmarts, including the last Kmart in Vermont, in Bennington. On May 21, 2018, Sears Holdings announced yet another round of liquidation sales in 40 Sears and Kmart stores across 24 states. These stores were closed by July 4, 2018. On May 31, Sears Holdings announced the liquidation of an additional 16 Kmart stores and 48 Sears stores, including the last Kmart in Hawaii. The closings announced May 31, 2018, were from among 100 unprofitable stores and Sears Holdings and the remaining 28 unprofitable stores were, a small group of stores that was pulled from the closing list, as they are being evaluated further, meaning even more store closings could occur later in the year. On June 28, 2018, Sears Holdings disclosed 10 of the stores being evaluated and announced they would close by September 2018. On July 13, 2018, news came through from multiple sources that even more Kmart stores were set to liquidate across the nation. On August 23, 2018, it was announced that 13 more stores would close by November. On October 15, 2018, Sears Holdings filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy and announced that it would close 142 stores, including 63 Kmart stores, which included the last Kmart in Arkansas, in Russellville, the last two Kmarts in Georgia, in Covington and Peachtree City, and the last two Kmarts in Kansas, in Kansas City and Salina. Sears Holdings bankruptcy also marked Kmart's second bankruptcy in 16 years. On November 8, 2018, Sears Holdings announced it would close an additional 40 stores, including 11 Kmart stores. On November 23, 2018, Sears Holdings released a list of 505 stores, including 239 Kmart stores, to be presented for sale in the bankruptcy process while all other stores were holding liquidation sales. However, the stores for sale were not guaranteed to be protected from liquidation in the future. 
On December 28, 2018, Sears Holdings announced it would close 80 additional stores, consisting of 37 Kmart stores, which included the only remaining Kmarts in five states, Crystal City, Missouri, Rapid City, South Dakota, Alliance, Nebraska, Metairie, Louisiana, and Gulfport, Mississippi. In a proposal announced in early January, Sears Holdings planned only to keep 202 Kmart stores along with 223 Sears stores open, assuming that it would survive the bankruptcy process. On January 15, 2019, when it had appeared that Kmart's parent, Sears Holdings, was preparing to file for Chapter 7 liquidation, the bankruptcy court judge ordered the company to return to the negotiating table and work out a new deal with Eddie Lampert to prevent the liquidation from occurring. A new deal was struck at the last minute that would keep up to 400 Sears and Kmart stores operating. On January 19, 2019, Sears Holdings officially announced that they had won the auction, and that some of the then-existing stores were to remain open. On January 24, 2019, a group of unsecured creditors, which included Simon Property Group, filed a motion with the bankruptcy court to overturn the deal Sears Holdings had recently made with Lampert, claiming Lampert had been engaged in serial asset stripping of the company at the expense of suppliers and landlords. The creditors had requested that the bankruptcy court rule to liquidate the company instead of allowing reorganization so that the creditors would be able to recover more money that was still owed to them. On January 28, the federal government-operated Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation announced that they were not in favor of Sears Holdings' current agreement with Lampert since that agreement would create a $1.7 billion funding gap in the employee pension fund, requiring American taxpayers to cover the shortfall. In papers filed on February 1 with the bankruptcy court, ESL outlined plans to close three Kmart stores per month in 2019 if the court would decide to accept ESL's purchase bid. In February 2019, it was announced that a U.S. bankruptcy judge approved the sale of the most lucrative part of Sears Holdings to Edward Lampert, allowing the surviving part of the company that operated both Sears and Kmart to remain in business at the expense of suppliers, landlords, employees, pensioners, the U.S. government, and other creditors. Kmart would have 202 locations after the sale was to be completed. The sale of 202 Kmart stores to Transform Holdco was finalized in February 2019, with the remaining Kmart locations liquidated to partially pay off Sears Holdings creditors. In May 2019, it was revealed that Kmart would close its store in Walla Walla, Washington in July, making it the first post-bankruptcy closure for the brand since being bought by ESL. On August 6, 2019, Transform Co. announced plans to close five additional stores by October 2019. At the time of the announcement, Transform Co. also added that it cannot rule out additional store closures in the near term. Between August 5 and 23, 2019, it was later announced that four more Kmarts would close. On August 29, 2019, the massive closure of 120 Kmart stores was announced, with the stores being closed by December 15, 2019. In November 2019, Kmart announced the closing of 45 stores in February 2020. On February 6, 2020, Kmart announced it would close 15 more stores. In May 2020, Kmart announced plans to close two additional stores, the last Kmart in North Dakota, in Minot, and the last Kmart in New Hampshire, in West Lebanon. Subsequently, in June 2020, the company announced their intention to close seven additional stores by the end of the year, one in Maryland, two in Puerto Rico, two in Pennsylvania, and two in California. In November 2020 it was announced that two Kmarts in Puerto Rico and the Kmart in Big Bear, California would close by February 2021, further reducing the number of remaining Kmart stores in the United States and Puerto Rico. On February 3, 2021, it was announced that Kmart would close seven stores, including its last store in Maryland, in Silver Spring, its last store in Massachusetts, in Hyannis, which was the last in New England overall, its last two stores in Pennsylvania, in Kingston and Willow Street, which left Kmart with a presence in six of the 50 states, and the Kmart in Belleville, New Jersey by mid-April. A few days later, additional closures were announced, including one Kmart in Kearney, New Jersey. This closing left only two Kmarts in New Jersey. Two additional closings in California were announced, in Watsonville and South Lake Tahoe. Kmart locations in Freedom and South Lake Tahoe are both scheduled to close August 22, 2021. This will leave the store in Grass Valley as the last Kmart in the state. In Florida, stores in Marathon and Key Largo both closed in May 2021, while the store in Hollywood closed in 2019. In New York City, the Kmart in Astor Place on 770 Broadway in Manhattan closed July 11, 2021, leaving two locations in the Bronx. 
As of April 2022, Kmart is down to only three locations that remained in the United States, in Miami, Florida, Westwood, New Jersey, and Bridgehampton, New York. On August 2, 2023, it was announced that the store in Westwood would be closing, leaving the Miami and Bridgehampton locations as the last two Kmart stores in the United States. Pathmark began when some of the supermarkets of the Wakefern Food Corporation parent company of ShopRite broke away in 1968 as some independent New Jersey grocers felt they needed to compete better with large supermarket chains. Some members of the cooperative agreed to operate their stores under the ShopRite name. Wakefern was both a wholesale operation and a retail operation among its members was a subgroup supermarkets operating co. In Union, New Jersey formed in 1956 by Alex Aid KMA and Herb Brody and Milt Perlmutter. This company opened ShopRite stores in 1963 it branched into non-food retail by acquiring Crown Drugs. Supermarkets Operating Co. and General Supermarkets merged in 1966 to become Supermarkets General Corporation with Perlmutter as president. Supermarkets General operated 75 ShopRite stores across Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, New York and Pennsylvania by 1966 with annual sales of about $420 million. Supermarkets General achieved high volume by opening large stores in densely populated areas and keeping prices low on both nationally branded goods and private label items. In 1968 Supermarkets General left the Wakefern Cooperative renaming its ShopRite stores Pathmark. Although Supermarkets General had other holdings including the recently acquired Gennings Howlands Goerkes and Steinbach department store chains and Rickel Home Centers Pathmark was its major operation. Pathmark's stores included not only supermarkets but 11 freestanding drugstores and 11 gasoline stations. Pathmark's 81 supermarkets were accounting for about 85% of Supermarkets General's sales and 80% of its earnings in 1969. Pathmark is well known by baby boomers for its radio and television commercials starring character actor James Caron who was the chain's spokesperson for more than 20 years. Peter Produce Pete Napolitano had starred in many of the company's commercials from 2001 until 2009. The number of Pathmark supermarkets had reached 91 in October 1971 with 38 others either a gas station or a drugstore. In May 1972 all but two of the 96 supermarkets began operating seven days a week and around the clock during the work week it was the first New York area supermarket chain to have stores with overnight hours and pioneered computer scanners at checkout counters. In 1977 after relative stagnation Pathmark opened its first super center a larger discount grocery store which also offered health and beauty aids small appliances and videotape rentals. These 50,000 square foot units generally were expanding and renovating existing stores. By December Pathmark had pharmacies in 81 of its 103 supermarkets horticulture departments in 64 bakery departments in 60 and, mini bank branches, in 13. In its 1977 annual report Supermarkets General claimed its sales per store were the highest in the industry. Pathmark does more than three times the business in a store only 33% larger than the industry average the report said. In its 1978 annual report Supermarkets General Pathmark had become the top supermarket chain in the New York area with a 15% share. 12 of its 109 stores now were super centers. That year Pathmark sales volume was $1.8 billion the chain contributed 82% to corporate profits. About 60% of the volume was generated in stores opened enlarged or substantially remodeled in the mid-1970s. Perlmutter died in 1978 and was succeeded by Louis Lowenstein as chief executive officer of Supermarkets General. After about a year Lowenstein was replaced by Vice Chairman Herb Brody who died in 1985 was succeeded by President Leonard Lieberman who remained CEO until the company went private co-founder Alex Aid KMA and remained on board until his retirement in 1987 and died in 1990. 
Pathmark sales reached $2.8 billion in 1982 when it was the nation's 10th largest supermarket chain. Of the 121 units 62 were supercenters 27 included a Barnes & Noble mini bookstore 19 had a cheese shop and 13 were freestanding drug stores. Pathmark continued to dominate supermarkets general sales and operating profits with 87 and 83 percent of the corporate total respectively. Pathmark opened its first Manhattan Superstore a 42,600 square foot unit in Pike Slip near Chinatown in 1983. The chain was still no one in the New York metropolitan area in 1985 with a 12.5% sales share. To foil a takeover bid by Dart Group Corp, management took Supermarkets General Private in a $2.1 billion leveraged buyout in 1987 in which Merrill Lynch Capital Markets Inc. received 55% of the shares Equitable Life Assurance Society of the US 35% with management retaining 10%. Servicing the debt soon proved a problem. The company sold 25 of its freestanding drug stores in New Hampshire and Massachusetts to the Melville Corp, which at the time operated CVS stores. Although corporate sales reached $6 billion in fiscal 1989 the 51 unit Rickle subsidiary was performing poorly while Pathmark now with 142 stores had slipped to third place in the New York area. Many Pathmark units had become according to a Forbes article, unkempt dirty and outmoded. The article goes on with, continues to stock scores of the dreary no-frills offerings customers have shunned for years. Merrill Lynch fired Chief Executive Kenneth Peskin replacing him with Jack Futterman. The only bright spot for the parent company was its 66-unit Purity Supreme division consisting of Massachusetts grocery and convenience store chains acquired in 1984. This division was sold in 1991 for about $265 million. Supermarkets General lost money in each fiscal year from 1988 to 1993 and sales volume annually during FI 1989 to 1993. In fiscal 1993 it lost a record $617 million on sales of $4.34 billion mainly reflecting a $600 million write down of goodwill in the 1987 buyout. The company's interest payments averaging between $160 million and $180 million yearly on its debt were hampering its efforts to modernize its stores and pace with competitors. Pathmark now had 146 supermarkets, 33 freestanding drug stores and 7 distribution processing facilities. In March 1993 Supermarkets General wanted to take Pathmark public but backed off due to insufficient investor interest. That October in a corporate reorganization Supermarkets General Corp, a subsidiary of Supermarkets General Holdings Corp, changed its name to Pathmark Stores Inc. In essence it recapitalized $1.3 billion in outstanding debt. Pathmark lowered its interest costs from 13% to 9% of revenue increasing cash flow which allowed Pathmark to increase capital investment. Rickle was spun off and sold in 1994. Pathmark now was betting on stores larger in size than its super centers. The Pathmark 2000 format introduced in 1992 consisted of units up to 64,000 square feet. In 1995 there were 27 such stores including some remodeled Pathmarks. The stores emphasized perishables including produce seafood baked goods flowers plus health and beauty aids in hoping to compete with drug store and discount competitors. These goods had higher profit margins than packaged groceries. Pathmark 2000 stores also featured a customer service desk for product returns video rentals film processing and UPS delivery and restrooms with tables for changing diapers. There were 44 such stores in May 1996 with 53 in February 1997. In 1994 Pathmark added to its private label products introducing an upscale line Pathmark preferred to its generic and mid-tier brands. Pathmark's over 3,300 private label items were accounting for about 24% of its sales. In late 1995 Pathmark launched Chef's Creations which offered a menu of entrees side dishes and salads made daily by chefs. In late 1996 Pathmark introduced Chef's Creations to go fresh pre-packaged meals for takeout offering choice entrees and side dishes in microwavable containers. 
an outside manufacturer was preparing these meals to Pathmark's specifications. By summer 1994 Pathmark regained popularity among New Yorkers according to one survey that found it to be the city's most popular supermarket chain. About one-sixth of city residents were regular Pathmark shoppers most of those cited its low prices. The top-ranking chain in Brooklyn, the Bronx and Staten Island Pathmark now was operating 17 superstores in the city. Meanwhile Pathmark's eight Connecticut units had declining sales each quarter. In 1992 two Connecticut supermarkets were converted to a new deep discount drug store format Pathmark Super Drug which reduced the perishable selection but greatly increased the store's general merchandise offerings as well as added a warehouse-sized package section. By 1994 another four Connecticut Pathmark supermarkets were converted. Pathmark Super Drug stores were modeled after similar chains such as Farmore. Pathmark was named 1995, Pharmacy Chain of the Year, by the magazine Drug Topics the first time a supermarket had won the award. Of Pathmark's 142 supermarkets all had pharmacies except six, found in shopping centers where there were lease restrictions. According to Pathmark it was the leader in filling prescriptions in the New York area and was participating in over 200 major insurance plans. Prescriptions accounted for nearly 7% of Pathmark's sales volume in 1994. Futterman Pathmark's chief executive officer is in fact a registered pharmacist. In June 1995 Pathmark reduced its pharmacy operations selling 30 of its 36 freestanding drugstores to Rite Aid Corp. for $60 million. These pharmacies had accounted for sales of $145 million in FI 1995 about 3.5% of Pathmark's total. A company executive said that although the 30 stores were profitable Pathmark had decided to concentrate on supermarket pharmacies which were more efficient and attractive to customers. Pathmark's remaining six drugstores operating under the Super Drug banner in Connecticut were closed in 1995 and 1996. In September 1998 Pathmark's two remaining Connecticut supermarkets in Bridgeport and Norwalk were closed signaling Pathmark's exit from New England. Construction began in August 1997 on Pathmark's controversial $14.5 million supermarket on 125th Street in Manhattan's East Harlem. This 53,000-square-foot unit was the largest supermarket in Harlem and had been bitterly opposed by owners of neighborhood convenience stores. This Pathmark was expected to generate hundreds of construction jobs and within the store which would include a pharmacy and a Chase Bank branch. Pathmark was planning its biggest Bronx store in 1998, a 55,000-square-foot unit on 10 acres in the blighted area east of Crotona Park. Supermarkets General cut its losses in fiscal year 1994 to 17 million dollars on net sales of 4.21 billion dollars. It had its first profitable year in fiscal year 1995 since fiscal year 1987 earning 10 million dollars on 4.21 billion dollars in net sales. Pathmark sales were 3.84 billion dollars and 3 dollars and 79 cents in fiscal 1994 and 1995 respectively. In fiscal year 1996 Supermarkets General had net income of $77 million on sales of $3.97 billion. Pathmark's sales were $3.85 billion. In fiscal year 1997 the parent company had a net loss of $20 million on sales of $3.71 billion. This included a charge the company took for the upcoming sale of 12 unprofitable Pathmark stores mostly in southern New Jersey. Pathmark's supermarket sales came to all but $9 million of the corporate total. Same store sales decreased 2.8% from the previous fiscal year primarily due to heavy competition. James Donald Futterman's successor as chief executive officer laid off over 200 employees at Pathmark's Woodbridge, New Jersey headquarters in March 1997. In 1997 Woodbridge was home to Pathmark's corporate headquarters and distribution facilities for dry groceries, meat, dairy and delicatessen products plus a distribution facility for frozen food in Dayton, New Jersey, a complex for dry groceries in New Brunswick, New Jersey and one for general merchandise in Edison, New Jersey. It had processing facilities for delicatessen products in Somerset, New Jersey and for banana ripening in Avenal, New Jersey. 
Pathmark stores ranged from 26,000 to 66,500 square feet in size. All but five were either Pathmark 2000 or Supercenter stores and all but seven included a pharmacy. In October 1997 Pathmark announced that CNS Wholesale Grocers of Brattleboro, Vermont would take over its distribution facilities and become the chain's supplier for almost all groceries and perishables. Pathmark received $50 million from the deal which was used towards its $1.47 billion debt. In 1999 Pathmark proposed the sale of itself to Royal Ahold a Dutch supermarket company which operated Edwards stores in the New York area. Under the terms of the deal Edwards superfood stores would become Pathmark's. The sale was abandoned after the FTC rejected a hold's offer to divest overlapping stores saying the offer would not preserve competition in the New York area. A hold decided to cancel the acquisition in 2000 it announced that it would rebrand Edwards stores as Stop and Shop. Because the FTC did not allow Pathmark's acquisition plans it filed for bankruptcy in July 2000 recovering early the next year. Pathmark in 2001 bought six Grand Union supermarkets that a hold was unable to buy. In 2005 the Ukaipa companies bought a 40% stake in Pathmark. In February 2007 Pathmark partnered with Wild Oats Markets by adding Wild Oats brand private label goods to the 141 Pathmarks. Approximately 150 organic and natural products were included in the partnership among them, Italia sodas, balsamic vinegar, organic fruit spreads and flat brea crackers. Later in 2007 the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company purchased Pathmark for $665 million pending shareholder approval along with complying with antitrust laws. Conditions for the acquisition included the sale of six Pathmarks to competitors. Pathmark and ANP remained separate banners. Store-level staff were not affected while buying and back-office functions were consolidated. The merger was approved on December 3rd with the sale completed that month. In spring 2008 Pathmark introduced a price impact store concept under the Pathmark Save a Center brand. This format was introduced to remodeled stores in Irvington and South Edison, New Jersey. The Save A Center name had been used for A&P stores in the 1980s and for an A&P owned chain of stores in the New Orleans area which were sold in 2007. After the concept was tested in the two northern New Jersey stores A&P announced the conversion of 16 Pathmark Super Centers plus 8 of the 13 Philadelphia area A&P Super Fresh stores to the Pathmark Save A Center banner. A&P eventually rolled out the Save A Center branding to Pathmark's website and circulars. In 2009 several changes were made to Pathmark, among them the North Edison New Jersey store was closed and a former ANP in nearby South Plainfield opened as a Pathmark Save A Center. The North Plainfield Pathmark also closed as part of this store consolidation. Meanwhile ANP was updating its former Super Center branding by retrofitting older stores with new interior decor to comply with its Save A Center branding. In autumn 2010 ANP closed 25 stores including some Pathmark stores. In August 2011 a super fresh store opened in the Northern Liberties section of Philadelphia in place of a planned Pathmark reflecting the parent company's diminished faith in the Pathmark banner. On December 12, 2010 ANP filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection citing assets of $2.5 billion and debts totaling $3.2 billion. The company emerged from bankruptcy on March 13, 2012 making its six supermarket divisions including Pathmark Private. On July 26, 2013 the Wall Street Journal reported that ANP is seeking to sell the company after emerging from bankruptcy in 2012. On July 19, 2015 ANP filed for Chapter 11 protection for the second time in less than five years. By November 25, 2015 all Pathmark stores were either closed or sold to other chains such as Acme Markets and other competitors. The 156-year history of ANP also disappeared. 
On February 10, 2016 retailer-owned cooperative Allegiance Retail Services LLC purchased the Pathmark name and all intellectual property associated with the brand including the logo trademarks and the domain name. The purchase price was not disclosed. On April 19, 2019 Allegiance opened a fully renovated supermarket under the Pathmark brand in a former key food supermarket which had been a Pathmark prior to 2015 located in Brooklyn, New York. Sears, the complete story. Sears bears the name of Richard W. Sears, who was working as a North Redwood, Minnesota, freight agent for the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad in 1886 when a local jeweler gave him an unwanted shipment of pocket watches rather than return them to the manufacturer. Sears sold them to agents down the line who then resold them at the retail level. He ordered and sold more watches and within six months made $5,000. He quit the railroad and founded the R.W. Sears Watch Company in Minneapolis. Business expanded so quickly that Sears moved to Chicago in 1887 to be in a more convenient communications and shipping center. Soon customers began to bring in watches for repairs. Since he knew nothing about fixing them, Sears hired Alva Roebuck, a watch repairman from Indiana, in 1887. A shrewd and aggressive salesman, a colleague once said of him, he could probably sell a breath of air Sears undersold his competition by buying up discontinued lines from manufacturers and passing on the discounts to customers. At various times from 1888 to 1891, thinking himself bored with the business, Sears sold out to Roebuck but came back each time. In 1888 the company published the first of its famous mail-order catalogs. It was 80 pages long and advertised watches and jewelry. Within two years the catalog grew to 322 pages, filled with clothes, jewelry, and such durable goods as sewing machines, bicycles, and even keyboard instruments. In 1894 the catalog cover proclaimed Sears was the cheapest supply house on earth. The company changed its name to its current form in 1893, but Alva Roebuck, uncomfortable with his partner's financial gambles, sold out his share two years later and remained with the firm as a repairman. Sears promptly found two new partners to replace Roebuck, local entrepreneur Aaron Nisbaum and Nisbaum's brother-in-law, haberdasher Julius Rosenbald. The company recapitalized at $150,000, with each man taking a one-third stake. The company continued to prosper, when the cantankerousness bound was forced to sell out in 1901 after clashing with Sears, his interest was worth $1.25 million. There was little harmony between the two remaining partners, Rosenvault and Sears. Sears believed in continuous expansion and risk-taking, Rosenvault advocated consolidation and caution. Rosenvault also objected to his partner's fondness for the hard sell in the catalog and advertising copy. Had the Federal Trade Commission existed then, some of the company's advertising practices probably would not have passed muster but it should be mentioned that Richard Sears invented the unconditional money-back guarantee and stood by it. In 1905 construction began on a new headquarters planned on Chicago's west side to consolidate all of the company's functions. To help raise the necessary capital, Sears went public in 1906. Yet Wall Street was leery of the incautious Richard Sears and he resigned as president in 1908 when it became clear he was obstructing the firm's progress. He was appointed chairman, but his heart was never in the job and he retired in 1913, never having presided over a board meeting. Sears died the following year at the age of 50. Near the end of his life, he summarized his career as a merchant, honesty is the best policy. I know, I've tried it both ways. Sears was now Julius Rosenbalt's company to run and he did it with such skill and success he became one of the richest men in the world. Sales rose sixfold between 1908 and 1920, and in 1911 Sears began offering credit to its customers at a time when banks would not even consider lending to consumers. During this time the company grew to the point where its network of suppliers, combined with its own financing and distribution operations, constituted a full-fledged economic system in itself. Rosenwald's personal fortune allowed him to become a noted philanthropist he gave away $63 million over the course of his life, much of it to Jewish causes and to improve the education of Southern blacks. As a result of the latter, he became a trustee of the Tuskegee Institute and a good friend of its founder, Booker T. Washington. The depression of the early 1920s dealt Sears a sharp blow. In 1921 the company posted a loss of $16.4 million and emitted its quarterly dividend for the first time. Rosenvault responded by slashing executive salaries and even eliminated his own. He was also persuaded to donate 50,000 shares from his personal holdings to the company treasury to reduce outstanding capital stock and restore the firm's standing with its creditors. 
Sears thus weathered the crisis and benefited from the general prosperity that followed. Rosenbalt retired as president in 1924, retaining the chairmanship he had inherited from Richard Sears. He was succeeded by Charles Kittle, a former Illinois Central Railroad executive. In 1925 Sears began to take on its current shape when it opened its first retail outlet in Chicago. Seven more stores followed that year and by the end of the decade 324 outlets were in operation. Retailing became so successful for Sears that by 1931 the stores topped the catalog in sales. The company's entry into retailing was the brainchild of Vice President Robert Wood, who was an executive at our tribal Montgomery Ward before Rosenbald hired him in 1924. Wood was always known as the general after serving as the U.S. Army's Quartermaster General during World War I. He had also been Chief Quartermaster for the construction of the Panama Canal. He much preferred business to the military, however, and his long career in merchandising earned him a reputation for genius. For its first 40 years, Sears had targeted the U.S. farmer as its main customer, luring him with a combination of down-home earthiness and the tantalizing prospect of material luxury. Two postal service innovations the rural free delivery system in 1891 and the parcel post rate in 1913 had helped target this consumer by making it affordable to reach remote locations by mail. Sears quickly became parcel post's largest single customer. Then Wood saw that automobiles would soon make urban centers more accessible to outlying areas, broadening the customer base for retail outlets. Thwarted by the conservative top management at Wards, he wasted no time in implementing his vision at Sears. At first, the stores simply absorbed surpluses from the catalog, but they soon began to offer a full range of goods. Sears also became the first chain to put free parking lots next to its stores. More than anyone else, it was Robert Wood who turned Sears into a leviathan. Charles Kittle died suddenly in 1928 and Wood succeeded him. In 1929 Sears arranged a merger between two of its suppliers, Upton Machine and 1900 Washer Company, to form 1900 Corporation, which changed its name to Whirlpool in 1950. Somewhat against its intentions, Sears became increasingly involved in the affairs of its suppliers, many of which were small companies whose outputs were almost entirely geared to its needs. Another leadership change occurred in 1932 when Julius Rosenbalt died at the age of 69 and was succeeded as chairman by his son Lessing. Lessing Rosenbalt retired in 1939. Preoccupied with running his father's estate, he had never attended a board meeting. Wood succeeded him, and the power of chief executive passed from the presidency to the chairmanship. At about this time, however, Wood also became controversial because of his prominent support for America First, an isolationist organization from which Charles Lindbergh made his notorious anti-Semitic speeches. Wood dropped his backing once the U.S. entered World War II and publicly supported the war effort, but remained a strong critic in private ever after. As war loomed, Sears benefited from increases in military spending and a consumer buying panic. In 1941 sales reached an all-time high of $975 million, a 30% increase over the previous year. Sales then leveled off, however, and raw material shortages made durable goods hard to come by. Even as late as 1946 Sears had to refund $250 million in orders that could not be filled. Military procurement, however, helped make up for the shortfall. During the war, Sears supplied the armed forces with just about everything that did not need gunpowder to make it work, and even a few things that did as some factories belonging to Sears suppliers were converted into munitions plants by the War Department. Sears also began its first foreign ventures during and immediately after the war. In 1942 a store opened in Havana, later nationalized by the Castro government in 1960, and several opened in Mexico in 1947. Once the war ended Sears flourished with sales up to $1 billion in 1945, which doubled the next year. Anticipating an economic boom, Wood launched an aggressive expansion program. Concentrating on the Sun Belt states, he located many of the new stores in the path of suburban expansion before the areas built up. One store in California was established on a dairy farm and had cows roaming around the parking lot when it opened. Thanks to the general's prescience, Sears left its rivals in its wake. In 1946 it held a small sales advantage over Montgomery Ward, but in 1954 posted sales of $3 billion while Ward, which had been slower to anticipate post-war trends, mustered only $1 billion. Sears also became a symbol of U.S. prosperity. In the late 1940s the Moscow bureau chief for the Associated Press reported that the most effective piece of foreign propaganda in the Soviet Union was the Sears catalog. At the same time, Sears became a widely hailed living experiment in corporate management. Wood had long wanted to decentralize the company and its post-war success gave him the luxury to remold it in his image of corporate democracy. 
the merchandising operations were carved up into five regional territories with each given a high degree of autonomy. Although buying operations remained centralized in theory, buyers were in fact allowed substantial independence. To its employees, many of them returned veterans, the company hired 50,000 people between 1946 and 1949 alone, Sears became, as author Donald Katz put it in the big store, a place where country boys and infantrymen could speak their minds and still roam free. During the early 1950s Sears began to stock more clothing as durable goods sales slackened. The new post-war suburbanites who bought their first homes had already filled them with all the Sears appliances they needed. At about this time the company strengthened its ties with its suppliers even further. Between 1951 and 1960 Sears acquired virtually complete control of Warwick Electronics, which made televisions, radios, phonographs, and tape players. In 1961 it effected a merger between 15 of its soft goods suppliers and created the Kelwood Company. Robert Wood retired in 1954 at the age of 75, but retained power over appointment of his successors until shortly before his death in 1969. A series of caretaker chairmen followed him, none of whom served more than six years. In 1963 the company posted sales of $5.1 billion, and an executive with the discount chain Corvette quipped that Sears was not only the number one retailer in the United States, but also numbers 2, 3, 4, and 5. Surveys showed that one in five U.S. consumers shopped at Sears regularly, its sales volume was greater than that of some entire industries. The company had become big enough to justify its own shopping center development subsidiary, Homart Development, which had been formed in 1960. In 1967 Sears posted $1 billion in monthly sales for the first time. In 1970 Allstate Enterprises, a subsidiary formed in 1960, acquired Metropolitan Savings and Loan Association, the first of several savings and loans it purchased over the next two decades. Also in 1970, construction began in Chicago on the 110-story Sears Tower. Completed in 1974, the Sears Tower was the tallest building in the world for many years and a symbol of corporate pride at a time when Sears dominated U.S. retailing unchallenged. That era was fading, however, even as its monument rose above the Chicago skyline. Recession caused by skyrocketing oil prices led to a $170 million drop in profits in 1974 on only a modest sales increase, and financial performance remained flat through the middle of the decade. It became apparent to many that success had made Sears complacent and the company had long ignored some real problems. Competition was also getting serious. Specialty shops that filled the very malls anchored by Sears stores were cutting into market share, as were such discounters as the resurgent SS Kresge Company, which changed its name to Kmart Corporation in 1977. Hard times meant the company's shortcomings could no longer be obscured by success or justified in the name of tradition. Sears had to be shaken up, and it fell to Edward Telling, a company veteran who took the reins in 1978, to do it. Formerly head of the Eastern Territory, Telling had smashed local concentrations of power in the name of efficiency and proceeded to do the same for the parent company, centralizing all buying and merchandising operations. The once revolutionary territories were slowly eliminated. Income declined from 1978 to 1980 and was subjected to intense scrutiny by Wall Street. Outsiders were not always impressed by Telling, a downstate Illinois native whose homespun manner tended to conceal often by choice his erudition and keen intellect. It was through his guidance that Sears undertook a major corporate reorganization in 1981. Telling also saw the burgeoning financial services industry as one in which Sears should get involved. In 1981 Sears acquired the Los Angeles-based Coldwell Banker Company, the nation's largest real estate brokerage, and securities firm Dean Witter Reynolds Incorporated three years later, Sears launched Prodigy, an online service, with IBM and CBS. At the end of 1985 Telling retired and left a radically different company from the one he had inherited. He had reigned in the once sprawling bureaucracy of Sears and taken the first steps toward diversifying into the burgeoning financial services market. Telling was succeeded by Edward Brennan, who had headed up the merchandising division, and had always preached that Sears was just one big store. In 1985 the Discover card was unveiled, a combined credit and financial services card that also offered savings accounts through Greenwood Trust Company, a bank acquired by Allstate Enterprises earlier in the year. By this time, it was estimated that one in every 30 living Americans had worked for the company in some way at some time. In 1987, perhaps conceding that the era of the big general merchant was over, the merchandise division launched a new strategy to turn Sears into a collection of specialty superstores. The next year Sears acquired iCare Centers of America, Pinstripes Petites, and Western Auto Supply as its workforce reached an all-time high of 520,000. 
yet the surge of adrenaline anticipated by Coldwell Banker and Dean Witter failed to materialize. As stock prices lag, takeover rumors circulated and management pondered ways to increase shareholder value and stave off possible attempts. In late 1988 Sears announced plans to sell Coldwell Banker's commercial real estate unit, the Sears Tower, it also planned to buy back some of its own stock. Further, Brennan, who had become company chairman in 1986, announced a new retail strategy of everyday low prices to reduce the number of sales and promotions. These new moves, however, provided unsatisfactory solutions. The Sears Tower went on the block during a commercial real estate glut in Chicago and no buyer was found. Lower prices squeezed profit margins because of the company's still bloated cost structure. Merchandising profits fell from more than $700 million in 1986 to $257 million in 1990, as overall profits slid from over $1.3 billion to $892 million during the same period. Whether or not Sears could sustain financial improvement through growing sales remained to be seen in the early 1990s. Brennan, representing the third generation of his family to work for Sears, was under considerable pressure from investors in the financial press to turn the company around and increase outsider representation on the board of directors. In 1992 the company slashed 47,000 jobs and suffered a shocking year-end loss of almost $2.3 billion on sales of $53.1 billion. To stay further losses and concentrate on the company's department store roots, Brennan began what became the largest restructuring ever. He sold the iCare centers, the remainder of Coldwell Banker, and spun off Dean Witter and the Discover Card services. The automotive group, under siege after a service fraud scandal and 20% sales dive, quit repairs to concentrate on selling tires and batteries, then filled vacant bays through a deal with Pennzoil's Jiffy Lube. In merchandising, Brennan's hand-picked successor, Arthur C. Martinez, moved quickly and decisively to put a shine to the tarnished Sears image. Catering to female consumers, Martinez launched a far-reaching advertising campaign on the softer side of Sears, brought in more famous name clothing items, and put the company's former mainstay the 101-year-old catalog out to pasture. Year-end figures for 1993 supported the streamlining efforts in the $4 billion renovation program with lesser sales but a return to profitability at $2.4 billion. By 1994 the Sears half-million-plus workforce had been whittled to less than 361,000, underperforming stores were closed, and others enlarged to include national brand names. The company was also finally relieved of the Sears Tower and freed of $850 million of debt. The next year was filled with more immense change Brennan retired and was succeeded by Martinez, and Allstate, the country's largest publicly held property and casualty insurance carrier with over $20 billion in sales, was spun off. In addition, Martinez added further feminine touches to Sears with 152 Circle of Beauty in-store cosmetics boutiques providing skin care, fragrance, bath, makeup, and stress-relieving products. To make way for the beauty lines, appliances, hardware and furniture were moved out of mall-based stores and into their own freestanding buildings to help serve the rural segment previously handled by the catalog. Sears also followed rival J.C. Penney's lead and introduced its own line of denim sportswear under the Canyon River Blues label. Although Lee and Levi's jeans had always been big sellers at Sears, the private label ran about $10 less and debuted with a splashy media campaign in late 1995. In just seven months Canyon River Blues apparel rang up $100 million in sales. Likewise, the newly upgraded jewelry and shoe departments gained double-digit growth while Western Auto, the company's stalwart auto titan, spawned a line of aftermarket merchandise stores called Parts America, opening 30 stores in 1995 and planning another 60 for the following year. While revenue climbed only a notch to $34.9 billion for 1995, net income was a $31.8 billion with retail profits hitting $1 billion for the first time. Another success story in the late 1990s was the Sears credit card, which contributed mightily to the company's revenue by attracting 6.4 million new cardholders in 1996 alone, bringing the nationwide total to 55 million. Other highlights of the year included Martinez being named Financial World CEO of the Year and the purchase of Orchard Supply Hardware. Yet by the following year Sears had started to stall once again, so Martinez began trimming underperforming operations including selling off most of the firm's stock in Sears Roebuck de Mexico SA, bailing out of the Prodigy slash IBM joint venture, and surprising investors in 1998 by getting rid of Western Auto and its Parts America chain. Also on the selling block were the underperforming home life furniture stores, with the majority stakes sold to a subsidiary of Citicorp. As the downward slide continued, executives jumped ship, thousands were laid off, and Martinez himself left Sears in 2000. 
Martinez's successor came from within the ranks as Alan J. Lacey took the reins in October 2000 as president and CEO and added chairman by the end of the year. As a former CFO and head of card services, Lacey was an insider and reportedly well-liked by both board members and Wall Street. Although Sears rallied briefly with strong appliance sales and growth in its credit card revenues, apparel sales were weak. The well-known softer side campaign had garnered plenty of attention and early success, but the words had come to mean something entirely different in the minds of investors. Despite the soft sales, however, there were steady gains in footwear and a new housewares concept called the Great Indoors. In 2001 Sears aggressively touted its new gold MasterCard with a low introductory rate, hoping to convert many of its regular Sears credit card holders to the more widely accepted format. Next came financing for the embattled home life stores, but the move soon proved too little too late for the 133 store chain. Suffering a similar fate were the initially popular circle of beauty in-store boutiques, the beauty products line was discontinued in the summer of 2001 along with a fragrance joint venture with Avon. A major makeover of the company's 867 stores was also underway, to better compete with JCPenney, Walmart, Target, and rising star Kohl's department stores. While 2001 year-end revenues rose slightly from the previous year's figures, operating income fell from $1.3 billion in 2000 to $735 million for 2001 due to the various write-offs and cost-cutting measures. Cautiously optimistic, Lacey and his board members were soon ecstatic when share prices soared in early 2002, hitting $54 in April and $59 in May, seeming to herald the long-awaited turnaround. The optimism, however, was short-lived. Sears had come to rely on its credit cards and financing operations too heavily. The Sears MasterCard, with 22 million cardholders, accounted for less than half the company's charged customers and the new card seemed to be cannibalizing its siblings. Lacey's solution was to convert all Sears account holders to the MasterCard. A good idea, yet with higher credit limits and newly launched cash advances, defaults were soon on the rise. Coupled with still sluggish apparel sales, Sears faltered once again, stock prices plummeted and heads rolled. The year's only bright spot had been the June acquisition of catalog and online retailer Land's End, for $1.80 billion though some worried what was seen as a good move for Sears was a bad move for Land's End. Would Land's End prove the venerable retailer's savior? Or would the cost dimple an already taxed bottom line? In 2002 and 2003 these questions were answered short term at least when Sears once again bounced back. Both Land's End and a new basics label called Covington pumped up apparel sales, with revenues, income, and stock prices all gaining. Despite declines in credit card revenues, Sears continued to bolster its image with both consumers and Wall Street, for a while. In 2003 such stalwarts as Walmart and even fast food giant McDonald's found themselves in a financial slump, and the same was once again true for Sears. Pink slips were given to hundreds of employees at the company's headquarters in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and its credit card unit formerly a cash cow was up for sale. In July Citigroup announced that it would purchase the company's credit card business for $3 billion. In addition to the much-needed cash resulting from the deal, which was expected to close by year-end, Sears would retain another $3 billion it had in the business as a portfolio reserve. Once the world's largest retailer, Sears had suffered through almost four decades of turmoil. In 2003 the mass merchandiser was ranked fourth behind Walmart, Target, and Home Depot, with its future uncertain. Though updated full-line stores were making an impact with consumers, the instability of the economy and job losses made mall shopping more of a luxury than a necessity. Competition continued to be fierce Walmart and Target usually beat Sears in price, J.C. Penney spiffed up its teen lines, and Upstart Kohl's attracted customers in droves with brand new stores and numerous splashy advertising campaigns. While Sears continued to struggle with its identity, what had not changed were its famously dependable appliances, tools, and selection of sturdy, low-priced apparel. With new private labels including Covington and the acquisition of Land's End, Sears endeavored to achieve the stability and sales it once took for granted. On November 17, 2004, Kmart Holdings Corporation announced it would acquire Sears, Roebuck, and company for $11 billion after Kmart completed its recovery from bankruptcy. As a part of the acquisition, Kmart Holding Corporation, along with Sears, Roebuck, and Co., was transformed into the new Sears Holdings Corporation. The new company started trading on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange as SHLD. Sears sold its single-letter ticker symbols in the New York Stock Exchange that it had held since 1910 to Sprint Corporation. The new corporation announced that it would continue to operate stores under both the Sears and Kmart brands. In 2005, the company began renovating some Kmart stores and converting them to the Sears Essentials format, only to change them later to Sears Grands. 
The combined company's profits peaked at $1.5 billion in 2006. By 2010, the company was no longer profitable. From 2011 to 2016, the company lost $10.4 billion. In 2014, its total debt exceeded its market capitalization. Sears declined from more than 3,500 physical stores to 695 U.S. stores from 2010 to 2017. Sales at Sears stores dropped 10.3% in the final quarter of 2016 when compared to the same period in 2015. Sears spent much of 2014 and 2015 selling off portions of its balance sheet, namely, Land's End and its stake in Sears Canada, one of the biggest e-commerce players in Canada. With $505 million in Canadian sales in 2015 more than Walmart and others who had begun pushing aggressively into online sales, such as Canadian Tire, Sears stated that the company was looking to focus on becoming a more tech-driven retailer. Sears's CEO and top shareholder said the sell-off of key assets in the last year had given the retailer the money it needs to speed up its transformation. Sears Holdings had lost a total of $7 billion US dollars in the four years to 2015. In part, the retailer was trying to curb losses by using a loyalty program called Shop Your Way. Sears believed the membership scheme would enhance repeat business and customer loyalty in the long term. CEO Eddie Lampert also concluded an arrangement that sold the Craftsman brand to Stanley Black & Decker Inc. for approximately $900 million US dollars. In October 2017, Sears and appliance manufacturer Whirlpool Corporation ended their 101-year-old association, reportedly due to pricing issues, although Whirlpool continued supplying Sears with Kenmore branded appliances. In May 2018, Sears announced it had formed a special committee to explore the sale of Kenmore. A closed Sears store at Stones River Town Center, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in April 2019, with signage still intact. The store closed on February 11, 2019. On September 24, 2018, the retailer's CEO warned that the company was running out of time to salvage its business. Sears Holdings filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on October 15, 2018, ahead of a $134 million debt payment due that day. On November 23, 2018, Sears Holdings released a list of 505 stores, including 266 Sears stores, that were for sale in the bankruptcy process, while all others would hold liquidation sales. On January 16, 2019, Sears Holdings announced it would remain open after Lampert won a bankruptcy auction for the company with an offer to keep about 400 stores open. On February 7, 2019, a bankruptcy judge approved a $5.2 billion plan by Sears's chairman and biggest shareholder to keep the business going. The approval met roughly 425 stores, including 223 Sears stores, and 45,000 jobs would be preserved. A new Sears home and life store in Lafayette, Louisiana, as depicted in November 2020. It closed in May 2023 along with all other remaining small format Sears stores in the U.S. In April 2019, Sears announced the opening of three new stores with a limited set of merchandise under the name Sears Home and Life. Also that month, Sears closed its store at Windward Mall in Kaneohe, Hawaii, and its store at Oak Brook Center in Oak Brook, Illinois, making it the first post-bankruptcy closure for the brand since being bought by ESL. On June 3, 2019, the company announced that Transform Hold Co. would acquire Sears hometown and outlet stores. As per deal, it might need to divest its Sears outlet division to gain approval. On August 6, 2019, it was announced that 26 stores, including 21 Sears stores, including the last Sears store in Alabama, at Riverchase Galleria in Hoover, and the last Sears store in West Virginia, at Huntington Mall in Bobbersville, would close in October, with plans to accelerate the expansion of our smaller store formats which includes opening additional home and life stores and adding several hundred Sears hometown stores after the Sears hometown and outlet transaction closes. On August 31, 2019, management announced that Transform would close an additional 92 stores, including 15 Sears stores, by the end of 2019. 100 more stores closed by January 2020. 51 Sears stores were closed in February 2020. More stores continued to close throughout 2020 and 2021, including the final Sears in Maine at the Maine Mall. As of September 16, 2021 the company's website listed 35 Sears stores. Near the end of 2019, Sears sold the brand name Die Hard to Advance Auto Parts for $200 million. A closed Sears store in Illinois at Woodfield Mall in Schaumburg, Illinois, on November 14, 2021, closing the day as the last Illinois Sears store. In September 2021, Sears announced that it would close more stores, including the last Sears store in New York City. The New York City Sears closed by November 24, 2021, and will potentially be redeveloped. 
In December 2021, Transfermco announced its plans to sell the 2.3 million square foot Sears headquarters in Hoffman Estates, which includes 100 acres of undeveloped land. On January 19, 2022, Sears shut the remaining 15 Sears Auto Centers in the United States. The Sears Auto Center website now displays a message reading, Auto Centers have closed for business. We appreciate your patronage over the years. If you have any questions concerning warranty claims, please visit us at Sears Help. Although the organization is a shadow of its former self, it still operates a few locations. In May 2022, it was announced that roughly 100 more Sears hometown stores, including the last four in Michigan, would close permanently. On December 13, 2022, Sears Hometown filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It was later revealed that all remaining Sears Hometown stores would be liquidated and permanently closed. As of May 18, 2023, only 11 full-line Sears stores remain open. Earl Shine. Earl A. Shibes' association with automobiles began in the automobile mecca of Southern California in the 1920s. After graduating from Los Angeles High School in the late 1920s, Shibes secured a job as a gas station attendant rather than pursuing college. Through numerous oil and tire changes completed for the General Petroleum Company, Shibes gained valuable experience. Soon Shibes branched off onto his own purchasing his own service station in Los Angeles. Scheib fell into auto painting rather by accident. Customers frequently asked Scheib about auto painting shops so Scheib decided to paint a few cars in the station's garage during the evening hours when the station was closed. What began as a small after hours endeavor soon blossomed and Scheib could not keep up with demand. He thus sold his gas station and in 1937 opened Earl Scheib paint and body on a Los Angeles street corner near Beverly Hills. Scheib was the first to introduce production painting of automobiles in the United States. Touting low prices of $29.95 for sedans and $24.95 for coupes, Scheib seriously undercut competitors' prices which generally ran a few hundred dollars to paint an automobile. Because of the rock-bottom prices customers rushed to Scheib's shop reportedly causing traffic snarls that required assistance from the police. Open daily Scheib and his 10 employees painted between 150 and 210 cars per week during the early years. Earl Scheib hit a snag in the 1940s with the advent of World War II. The war generated a great demand for paint and paint supplies in the United States grew thin. Scheib was forced to lease a gas station to make ends meet and he fought to keep his business open. In 1946 however paint rationing ended and the auto painting business experienced tremendous growth and popularity. Scheib opened additional stores in the San Fernando Valley located just outside of Los Angeles to accommodate the demand. Scheib began to expand nationally in the 1950s and to raise awareness of his auto painting shops he turned to advertising. Earl Scheib marketed his shops through low-budget television commercials. Appearing on late-night television programs Scheib soon became a national icon and celebrity and his oft-heard sales pitch I'm Earl Scheib and I'll paint any car any color for $29.95. No UPS no extras became an instantly recognizable phrase. Scheib credited as being the first spokesperson for his own company handled all advertising and developed and wrote his own television commercials. Scheib believed viewers would find his ads more convincing and genuine if he spoke directly to the viewers about the company's offerings. Earl Scheib also handled media by placing his television and radio ads carefully. As son Donald explained in a company statement, he'd personally call the station manager and tell him to interrupt a sponsored show at a pivotal moment and run his ad. So you'd be watching his show the villain sneaking up behind the hero with a knife and just when he's about to plunge the knife into the hero's back. Earl comes on the screen pitching his service. Scheib's commercials were seen and heard on television and radio stations in more than 100 cities and he continued to film spots until his death in 1992. Despite his fame and television ad ubiquity son Donald claimed that Scheib was less than fond of appearing in commercials. In truth Donald Scheib said in a company statement he hated doing those television spots. He didn't like being in front of the camera you'd have to drag him feet first into that studio screaming. 
Earl Scheib Incorporated, which went public in 1963, was the largest non-franchised auto painting chain by the 1980s thanks in large part to founder Earl Scheib's promotional efforts. Though the cost of a standard Earl Scheib paint job had grown to $99.95, the chain's prices were still among the lowest in the industry and appealed to budget-minded consumers. Car owners were choosing to keep their cars longer and this trend was reflected in Scheib's sales. In the early 1980s the company's sales increased an average of 17.6% per year and between 1982 and 1985 the firm's stock quadrupled. By 1985 there were 275 Earl Scheib stores ranging from Hawaii to New York. The company opened its first store in Canada in 1984 and planned to open 25 new outlets in fiscal 1986. Overseas expansion was in the works as well and an Earl Scheib store opened in London in 1985. Despite sales growth in the 1980s Earl Scheib faced increasing competition in the industry it had essentially created. Chains and franchises such as Mako which had 380 outlets in 1985 and One Day Paint and Body were expanding more aggressively than Earl Scheib and taking away its market share. This competition coupled with Scheib's commitment to low prices presented challenges for the company. If the company continued to raise prices the cost of an Earl Scheib paint job had increased 43% between 1982 and 1985 at risk losing its standing as the low-budget alternative to more expensive shops some of which offered paint jobs starting at $129.95. In addition Scheib paint jobs had earned a reputation as being rather shoddy and the potential for customers to jump into a higher price range for better quality work was something Earl Scheib was forced to face. Some industry analysts believed Scheib could grow through diversification and the offering of more expensive and upscale services but the company was hesitant to change its tried and true formula. After reaching record sales of $69 million in 1987 Earl Scheib entered a period of decline. At the end of 1987 Earl Scheib announced plans to close its European auto painting operations. Though the company had entered the European market only two years earlier losses continued to build and future prospects appeared gloomy. The domestic situation seemed no better. Under Earl Scheib's command overall yearly sales sagged in the late 1980s and those sales began to inch upward in the early 1990s the company continued to rack up losses. For the third quarter ended January 31, 1991 Earl Scheib reported a net loss of $1.9 million on sales of $9.9 million. On February 29, 1992 a day after turning 85 Earl Scheib passed away leaving behind a legacy and a struggling business. A few days later on Monday March 3 the company's stock skyrocketed 47% as investors speculated about the future of the company. Many believed Scheib's 37% interest in the company would be sold in order to finance his estate taxes. Erwin Book Alder an Earl Scheib board member and executor of Scheib's estate indicated that the 37% stake would be divided between Scheib's three sons all of whom were employed by the company. Book Alder acknowledged problems with Scheib's management and commented in the Wall Street Journal that Scheib refused to take realization of the economy of what was happening to the auto painting business. He always felt he had to have the lowest prices in the business by a wide stretch. Scheib's belief book Alder noted prevented him from raising prices to compensate for slow sales. It was not until June 1991 that Scheib finally relented raising the price of a basic paint job from $99.95 to $119.95. Book Alder believed the stock rise was indicative of stock buyers' optimism about the company's potential for growth. A week after Earl Scheib's death his son Donald was named president and CEO. Donald Scheib had previously served as vice president. Erwin Book Alder was elected chairman. The company also announced that it had no plans to sell. The formidable task of turning around the ailing company was started. For fiscal 1993 the company reported sales of $53.64 million and a net loss of $110,000. The following fiscal year sales declined to $48.49 million yet net loss grew to $1.82 million. In November 1994 Donald Scheib stepped down as president and CEO and was elected chairman a position that had become vacant upon the death of Erwin Book Alder in August. 
Daniel Zeigel was appointed president and CEO and handed the task of making the 250 store chain profitable once again. With a new CEO leading the company Earl Scheib faced many changes in the second half of the decade. A major restructuring strategy was adopted in fiscal 1995 and as a result 84 unprofitable stores most situated in the Midwest and East were closed. The company took a pre-tax charge of $4.2 million for restructuring related costs. The following fiscal year Earl Scheib reported its first profit in four years. The company earned $895,000 on sales of $43.98 million compared to a loss of $5.55 million on sales of $47.28 million in fiscal 1995. The company also spent about $4.6 million to renovate and convert 137 stores into the new Earl Scheib paint and body store format. The new stores boasted an updated look including new paint and graphics as well as new exterior signs. The shops also offered a customer information center and modern equipment such as the infrared quartz finished drying system used to facilitate the drying of car paint. Conversions of stores in California were completed in early fiscal 1996 and results were positive during the first quarter comparable store sales grew by 24.2% compared to year earlier figures. The upswing in sales spurred Earl Scheib to renovate the remainder of its shops. Another challenge Daniel Zeigel and Chief Operating Officer Christian Beeman had to tackle was Earl Scheib's image. Many customers viewed the chain's auto-painting work as being of poor quality and new management needed to alter this perception if Earl Scheib was to once again reign the industry. Beeman reflecting upon the state of the company in 1995 admitted in the Dallas Morning News in 1998, we mainly had the Earl Scheib name. That was the good news. That was also the bad news. The new shop format was designed to boost the chain's image and to back up its new exterior Earl Scheib started developing a new top quality paint. We definitely had some of the worst paint in the industry Beeman recalled in the Los Angeles Daily News. When I first got here I received letters from customers complaining about the paint jobs. The paint that was chipping off was actually in the envelopes he added. The company-owned paint manufacturing plant in Missouri was called upon to create a high-quality auto paint and the outcome was Europaint the 100% acrylic urethane paint. Introduced in 1997 the paint provided durability and a high-gloss finish and was rated as the best paint in production auto painting by Paint Research Association Laboratories incorporated a paint testing firm. The paint as well as other changes effectively reduced the percentage of jobs that had to be redone because of poor quality. The company's redo rate dropped from 22% in 1995 to below 6% in the late 1990s. Earl Scheib stepped up its expansion efforts beginning in 1997 concentrating on opening more stores in existing markets to diminish the need for increased advertising expenditures and to fully penetrate existing markets. The chain opened five new stores during fiscal 1997 and the following fiscal year opened 12 new shops. Sales continued to grow reaching $48.34 million in fiscal 1997 up from $43.98 million the previous year. In late 1997 the company established a fleet sales department. The division which initially had a staff of 10 salespeople sought to establish multi-vehicle fleet sales accounts. It was hoped that fleet sales would help offset the regularly slow winter months. One of the first contracts secured by the fleet department was a three-year agreement with U.S. Airways Incorporated to paint about 3,500 ground vehicles and equipment. The fleet division also gained contracts with Orkin exterminating the Hertz Corporation and several government agencies. Hoping to grow to 200 shops and $100 million in sales Earl Scheib opened 19 new stores during 1999. The company also closed six stores bringing the year-end total to 174. Daniel Zeigel resigned as president and CEO in January and Donald Scheib retired from the board of directors in August. Zeigel remained a member of the board and Christian Beeman was appointed president and CEO. Sales for fiscal 1999 increased 8.2% from the previous year to reach $55 million. Although comparable shop sales increased by March 1% earnings were essentially flat due to various non-recurring expenses with most of the western states where rust and corrosion are less likely to be the problem. 
as increased sales return so did founder Earl Scheib's classic commercials the result of a resurrection of old television programs and commercials. Not only did Earl Scheib's ads appear on Nickelodeon's TV Land Cable Network which featured classic television shows and ads but Earl Scheib merchandise including t-shirts and hats were offered for sale through specialty catalog merchants. As Earl Scheib entered the year 2000 the company continued with its comeback strategy. The company hoped to increase sales in stores open for more than a year and to continue expansion. Earl Scheib also planned to seek strategic acquisitions to grow the company more quickly. As the year commenced however the outlook was restrained. Rising materials and administrative expenses among other factors affected first quarter sales which reached $15.75 million down from $15.90 million the previous year. Comparable store sales were hit harder dropping 6.7% compared to the first quarter of fiscal 1999. As a result first quarter net income reached $345,000 down considerably from the year earlier figure of $1 million. Earl Scheib remained focused and hopeful and planned to continue painting cars any car any color well into the 21st century however it was not to be as we all know it. On February 18, 2009 Earl Scheib and Kelly Capital LLC a private equity firm announced the signing of the merger agreement. Kelly Capital LLC acquired the company in the second quarter of 2009 following shareholder approval of a merger agreement. Beginning in July 2010 the company closed certain locations and franchised off the remaining locations to shop managers giving them the opportunity to become small business owners. Specifically the company offered them the rights to purchase all the equipment and fixtures in their shops and to use the Earl Scheib name for their own business. Many managers took advantage and agreed to the terms resulting in today's independent Earl Scheib paint centers. These modern Earl Scheib centers now offer paint jobs and most of today's Scheib shops also offer custom painting collision repair and pinstriping. Earl Scheib the company is no more but the name still lives on independently. Brickle Home Center The origins of the company date back to 1946 when brothers Al Mort and Bob Brickle went into business for themselves in Newark, New Jersey. The brothers formed their own heating business continuing a family tradition. A few years later the brothers purchased a warehouse full of plumbing supplies for, next to nothing. Unlike in most other cases where heating, cooling and plumbing are usually the domain of plumbers the Rickles specialized strictly in heat. Thus they had no idea what the actual value of the hall was and sought help. A friend put them in touch with a plumber named Bill Ryan who agreed to go through the items and determine how much they would sell for. Plumbing supplies were usually sold wholesale at this time which presented a problem for Al Mort and Bob. With the massive amount of supplies they had it was likely going to take a significant amount of time for them to sell them off to local plumbers. They came up with an idea that at the time had been unheard of. The idea was to start a business selling to the general public with Ryan as their salesman. In that role the brothers felt that he could not only sell the supplies to the people but pass along his plumbing knowledge to advise customers on how to fix their own toilets, sinks, drains etc. and with the correct parts to perform the repair. So in 1953 Al Mort and Bob opened up the first Rickle Brothers store in Union, New Jersey and Ryan was warmly referred to as, employee number one, for his entire 35-year stint in the chain. Rickle was one of the first do-it-yourself home improvement stores eventually expanding beyond plumbing supplies and selling heating and electrical supplies and tools in addition. An early slogan and jingle of the Rickle chain which lasted in some degree to its 1997 closure was, Rickle helps you do it better, do it better with Rickle, a reflection of the Rickle brothers focus which included employees who could explain to customers how to perform their own home repairs. The concept took off and enabled Rickles to develop a loyal customer base. The Rickles began expanding quickly after their first store became a success and by the early 1960s were operating three locations all in New Jersey Succasuna Paramus East Brunswick in a new location in Union. By 1967 the Rickle Supermarts chain had six stores all in New Jersey opening in Menlo Park and Wayne. The Rickles then began expanding at a more rapid pace, opening more stores in New Jersey and entering the New York and Pennsylvania markets for the first time. 
During this time a corporate headquarters in 1973 and a primary distribution center in 1988 was established in South Plainfield, New Jersey. The Rickle brothers sold the still-growing chain of Rickle Supermarts to Supermarkets General Corporation the parent company of the Pathmark supermarket chain in 1969. After the sale SGC renamed the chain, Rickle Home Centers, which lasted until its closure. In 1975 the Rickle division of SGC recorded $80 million in sales and was the dominant home improvement retailer in the region far outselling its larger competitors such as Channel. The subsequent decade was a time of continued expansion as the Rickle chain grew to over 30 stores by 1985. However Supermarkets General's fortunes were starting to turn as the company entered a financial downturn that it stayed locked in for the next two decades. While Rickle was doing well its corporate sibling Pathmark was losing money and dragging the company's finances down with it. In 1987 the Dart Group made a hostile takeover bid to acquire SGC. In a move to avoid the takeover management took the company private by engineering a $2.1 billion leveraged buyout. Merrill Lynch Capital Markets Inc. received 55% of the shares Equitable Life Assurance received 30% and SGC management retained 10%. The company's debt grew to $1.6 billion by early 1990 half of it in junk bonds primarily as a result of the buyout. Servicing the debt became SGC's objective and largest problem. Around the time of Supermarkets General's cash flow problems the Atlanta Georgia-based home improvement chain Home Depot began to open stores in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. Although Rickle Channel and local hardware stores all felt the effects of Home Depot's entry and quick expansion into their market area Rickle's problems were made worse by its parent company's financial state. This helped lead to a somewhat contentious relationship between Rickle and Home Depot over the next few years. An early example of the consequences of the rivalry between Rickle and Home Depot can be seen in an incident surrounding PBS long-running home improvement series This Old House. For many years Home Depot has been one of the largest sources of financial support for the non-commercial program. In 1989 however this relationship nearly came to an end. This Old House host Bob Vila who had been with the show since its 1979 debut signed an endorsement deal with Rickle and did a series of commercials for them. Home Depot was angered by this and citing Vila's work for a competing business pulled its backing from this old house and its lumber supplier Weyerhaeuser followed. WGBH the producer of this old house responded by firing Vila from the show and replacing him with Steve Thomas in an attempt to convince Home Depot to return which they did. His relationship with Rickle did not last long as he became a spokesman craftsman tools and sears shortly after leaving this old house. Combined with Home Depot's expansion and its parent company's debt problems not only did Rickle find itself unable to compete with the rapidly growing Home Depot but it also began to lose market share to its local competitors who were on more secure financial footing. By fall 1993 it became apparent that Rickle's future was beginning to look grim. Supermarkets General was still in serious financial trouble as Pathmark's sales continued to slide and the company chose to keep its focus on trying to bring its primary brand out of decline. As a consequence of this Rickle was unable to receive the funding it needed to properly compete with the juggernaut that Home Depot was becoming. In 1994 Supermarkets General reorganized. The company changed its name to Pathmark Stores Inc. and began looking for ways to divest itself of its varied retail properties including Rickle. EOS Partners LP a venture capital firm based in New York made a bid for Rickle that Pathmark accepted on August 26, 1994. After that EOS struck a second agreement with GE Capital another venture capital firm which owned Rickle's competitor channel later that day. When the entirety of both deals were revealed EOS announced that its new acquisitions would merge into one. 59 of Channel's 60 stores became Rickle locations in the other remaining case Rickle operated a store in the former Ice World Hockey Arena in Totowa, New Jersey and opted to keep it over the Channel location that was nearby despite the Channel store being significantly larger. The merged company briefly rebranded itself as, the new Rickle, to reflect its change in direction. This was Rickle's first large wave of expansion since the 1960s and the chain's overall largest as Rickle's locations nearly tripled and it had opened stores in many new cities and towns it had not served before. Rickle thus adopted a new slogan, bringing it all closer to home, to acknowledge this. However all the news was not positive. 
Despite the addition of so many new stores to its fold the sales they generated were not enough to fully pull Rickle out of the tailspin it had found itself and in fact the sudden massive expansion proved to be hard on the company's finances. Also the battle with Home Depot for market share was continuing to be an uphill battle for Rickle and the chain would soon find itself in significant legal trouble. If things were not bad enough by the end of 1995 Rickle discovered that their financial situation was significantly more unstable than they had realized. The new sales figures from its 59 new stores had not done enough to correct the damage that the years of financial trouble that its former parent Pathmark had left on Rickle and thus a bankruptcy filing was looming as a serious possibility. To try and stave it off the company decided to close 13 underperforming stores. This did not work and on January 10, 1996 Rickle announced it had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection with another 13 locations liquidated by July. Although Rickle was starting to show signs of recovery that met with positive reactions, reality painted a different picture as the company appeared to be in a state of terminal decline. Rickle went through two more rounds of closures that ran into 1997 when those were done the chain was almost half the size of what it had been just two years before with 49 locations still operating. In 1997 Rickle decided to shift focus again and focus less on being a direct competitor to Home Depot which had now established itself as the New York area market leader in retail home improvement. Instead Rickle decided to focus on things that made it unique compared to the larger big box chain. Although Rickle was one of the larger and more successful home improvement chains in the area prior to Home Depot's entry into its market Rickle tended to operate in smaller facilities than Home Depot did even after its merger with Channel. For example a typical Home Depot store was well over 100,000 square feet in size. Rickle stores by comparison averaged approximately 40,000 square feet with a handful of stores such as the Totowa New Jersey store and the Wayne New Jersey store being larger. Rickle decided to use their size to their advantage and define themselves as more of a neighborhood home center. Since both Rickle and Home Depot sold many of the same items Rickle's strategy was to portray the stores as much easier to shop at than the immense Home Depot stores. The attempt did little if anything to either take business from Home Depot or lure customers to Rickle and in August 1997 a plan to allow the chain to remain open until at least February 1998 was rejected. Despite its best efforts it now seemed that it was no longer a matter of if the still in bankruptcy Rickle could reverse its fortunes and stave off its demise but instead a matter of how much time it had left before it would be forced to close for good. On October 11, 1997 Rickle made the announcement that the company ran out of cash to operate the remaining 49 stores and that the chain will start to liquidate. Most of the Rickles were closed by Thanksgiving 1997 with several more lasting until December as they received more merchandise from already shuttered stores. The last Rickle in Wayne, New Jersey closed in early 1998. Rickle still held leases on the 53 stores they were operating at the beginning of 1997 and office supply chain staples picked up 41 of those leases. The company's distribution center meanwhile was retaken by Pathmark. All three Rickle brothers have since died. Mort Rickle passed away at 61 in 1980 his two brothers would reach 90 before following him in death. Al Rickle passed away in 2008 and Bob Rickle passed away in 2014. Spiegel For the first 100 years of its history Spiegel was primarily a family business. The company was founded in 1865 by German-Jewish entrepreneur Joseph Spiegel who settled in Chicago where his brother-in-law Henry Liebenstein ran a furniture business. With Liebenstein's assistance Joseph Spiegel opened J. Spiegel & Company a small home furnishings retail operation located on Wabash Avenue in Chicago's Loop. In 1871 however the Great Chicago Fire destroyed most of its business district including the Spiegel store. After the fire Joseph Spiegel and a partner named Jacob Kin rebuilt the business and by 1874 the company was prospering again under their leadership. Kin retired in 1879. In 1885 Spiegel began running advertisements in several Chicago newspapers and the following year the company moved to a larger building on State Street. Joseph Spiegel's two oldest sons Modi Spiegel and Sidney Spiegel were brought into the business. Spiegel issued its first catalogs in 1888. 
The catalogs were made available to all potential customers who lived outside the city. Because a mail order system did not yet exist the catalogs served instead to lure people into the downtown store. By 1892 however the business had taken a turn for the worse as many customers were slow to pay for their items. The company went bankrupt that year. The company reinvented itself as Spiegel House Furnishings Company of Chicago in 1893. The principal difference was that the new company like many others in the furniture business sold on credit. The decision to offer installment plans and the timing of the decision that made possible expansion. The new Spiegel was more successful and in 1898 a branch store was opened on Chicago's South Side. Another South Side branch went into operation in 1902. The company's slogan We Trust the People reflected its emphasis on credit merchandising. In 1903 Joseph Spiegel's third son Arthur entered the business with a plan to develop mail order operations. After a couple years of lobbying Arthur convinced the company to open a mail order department and in 1905 Spiegel became the first company to offer credit through the mail. The new service was reflected by the company motto which began to read We Trust the People Everywhere. This and the fact they did not charge interest on extended credit helped increase their business substantially. In 1906 Spiegel's mail order sales were near $1 million. To handle the success of the mail order operation a new company Spiegel Maystern & Company was formed allowing the Spiegel House Furnishings Company to devote its limited resources to conventional retailing rather than assume the debts associated with building up the mail order segment. Arthur was named president of the new company. In 1909 Spiegel introduced the teddy bear to the American consumer for the first time nationwide by offering it in its mail order catalog. The Ideal Toy Company partnered with Spiegel to launch this successful toy venture and Spiegel for many years gifted its employees teddy bears to mark the company's anniversary. Spiegel began to diversify its line of products after 1910 offering apparel for the first time in 1912. After a couple of unsuccessful partnerships with independent clothing manufacturers Spiegel Maystern & Company began offering its own line of women's apparel. Martha Lane Adams, line named after its fictional designer was so successful that it quickly became a wholly owned subsidiary of Spiegel Maystern & Company and earned its own catalog. Martha Lane Adams sales grew to nearly $2 million by 1916. That same year Arthur Spiegel died of pneumonia at age 32. In 1926 company executive Ed Swickard introduced a promotional idea involving congolium floor covering. Swickard engineered a mailing to more than 9 million residences offering a pre-cut congolium package at a low cost. Customer response was such that company sales reached a record $16 million with a net profit of $4 million. In 1928 Spiegel Maystern & Company went public although the Spiegel family retained a controlling interest Spiegel stock prices reached $118 per share the same year. The Great Depression had a negative impact on the business. In 1930 Spiegel's stock dropped to 7 cents per share. In 1931 the Spiegel family began gradually liquidating their retail furniture business. By 1932 the last Spiegel furniture store in Chicago closed its doors. After experiencing considerable economic losses in the early years of the Depression Spiegel entered a period of growth and profits beginning in 1933. During this time MJ Spiegel took over the leadership of the company. Spurred again by the company's aggressive marketing of their easy credit without interest policy sales rose from $7.1 million in 1932 to more than $56 million by 1937. Furthermore a $300,000 net loss was transformed into $2.5 million in profits. When sales began to plateau in 1938 Spiegel shifted attention to consumers with higher incomes. The company began adding popular brand names to its catalog. The onset of World War II was financially disastrous for Spiegel due to manufacturing had shifted to wartime production many of their popular catalog products were no longer available in significant quantities. A labor shortage also affected the company's operations and when the US government discouraged buying on credit management had to discard its popular no charge for credit policy. In 1942 and 1943 combined the company lost $3.8 million. In 1944 in hopes of reversing the trend Spiegel began to open retail outlets once again hoping to mimic the success of Sears Roebuck & Co. and Montgomery Ward. The same year Spiegel also acquired 46 Sally Dress shops in Illinois and several other regional chains were purchased over the next few years. 
by 1948 Spiegel was operating 168 retail stores featuring a wide range of merchandise including clothing, furniture, electronics, housewares and auto supplies. After initial success in brick and mortar retail the costs of retail operations began to outweigh the benefits. By the mid-1950s Spiegel was again focusing on mail order sales on credit. Although nearly all of the company's retail outlets were sold off by 1954 several catalog shopping centers were retained so that customers could ask questions and place orders in person with company representatives. In 1955 Spiegel unveiled its budget power plan a liberal policy under which customers were offered a line of credit sometimes as high as $1,000 with low monthly payments. The idea was to add as many names as possible to the customer list. The company also expanded their range of products offered in the catalogs including outdoor power equipment such as mowers and tillers personal watercraft under the name Brookler and musical instruments using the old craftsman name. By 1960 sales greater than $200 million and nearly 2 million people held Spiegel credit accounts. In addition Spiegel began selling pets. In 1965 after 100 years of operation as a family business Spiegel was purchased by Beneficial Finance Company. Spiegel stockholders received shares of Beneficial stock and Spiegel became a subsidiary of Beneficial. Spiegel benefited from television exposure and advertising in the form of prizes given away on several game shows most notably The Price is Right and Let's Make a Deal. Announcers emphasized Spiegel's large catalog offerings and on-air promotional announcements. These programs would award contestants gift certificates of a certain dollar amount toward catalog items giving winners the flexibility to choose their own prizes. Rising interest rates in the mid-1970s made financing credit accounts costly. Also during that time Spiegel began encountering significant competition from discount stores such as Kmart which were rapidly establishing a national presence. In 1976 to help turn the company around Beneficial hired Henry Johnson a veteran of the mail order operations of Montgomery Ward in Avon. One of Johnson's first moves was to streamline management executives were fired and overall employees were reduced by half over the next five years from 7,000 in 1976 to 3,500 in 1981. Johnson also closed Spiegel's all remaining catalog stores. Johnson changed Spiegel's image to that of a fine department store in print. Accordingly the Spiegel catalog was completely revamped low-budget items were replaced by upscale apparel and accessories for career women. Merchandise bearing designer labels began appearing in 1980 when the company introduced a line of Gloria Vanderbilt products. Catalog sales in general boomed during the early 1980s. Spiegel's sales began to grow 25 to 30 percent a year. Although Spiegel still ranked fourth in catalog sales during this time trailing Sears J.C. Penney and Montgomery Ward the company's strategies were being followed very closely by larger competitors. In 1982 Beneficial sold Spiegel to Otto Versand GmbH a large private West German company prominent in catalog sales. Between 1982 and 1983 Spiegel's revenue increased from $394 million to $513 million and the company's pre-tax profits more than doubled reaching $22.5 million in 1983. In 1984 control of Spiegel was transferred from Otto Versand itself to members of its controlling family. Under new ownership Spiegel's transformation into an outlet for high-end products continued. In 1984 Spiegel began distributing specialty catalogs in addition to its four primary catalogs 25 of these specialty catalogs were in circulation by 1986 featuring Italian imports plus sized clothing and other specialty items. The same year Spiegel mailed a total of 130 million catalogs at a cost of 100 million dollars and company sales surpassed the 1 billion dollar mark for the first time. In 1987 6 million shares of non-voting stock was sold to the public marking the first time since 1965 that Spiegel was not completely privately held. In 1988 Spiegel acquired Eddie Bauer Inc., a retail chain specializing in sportswear and outdoor equipment from General Mills. Eddie Bauer which also has a catalog operation had annual sales of $260 million. In the first year following the acquisition the chain was expanded from 60 to 99 stores. 
By 1989 Spiegel had become the number three catalog retailer in the United States with a total circulation of 200 million catalogs including 60 different specialty catalogs and an active customer base of over 5 million. In 1990 Spiegel acquired First Consumers National Bank which began issuing credit cards and statements to Spiegel and Eddie Bauer customers. That year the company engaged in an aggressive advertising campaign for career women featuring actress Candice Bergen. The campaign also featured a specialty catalog promoted by Bergen emphasizing the inconvenience of department store shopping and the relative ease of shopping by catalog. The company began to expand its retail outlet operations based on lines from its catalogs. Spiegel stores included For You from Spiegel which offered plus-sized women's apparel and Crayola Kids providing a line of children's apparel first launched in 1991. In spite of these innovations the company's growth stagnated due to the economic recession and earnings declined sharply in 1991. Slight gains were realized the following year as Spiegel's revenue topped $2 billion. Eddie Bauer performed particularly well having grown to 265 stores. In August 1993 Spiegel announced its purchase of Newport News a catalog company specializing in moderately priced women's clothing. Later that year Spiegel published a new specialty catalog e-style a partnership between Spiegel and Ebony magazine featuring a clothing line aimed at African American women. The same year Sears discontinued all catalog sales and Spiegel and other specialty catalog retailers moved quickly to assume the leadership role and increase their own market share. Spiegel reported total revenues of $2.6 billion in 1993. Sales at Eddie Bauer stores reached $1 billion that year bolstered by 30 new locations. Between Spiegel and Eddie Bauer 81 different catalogs with a total circulation of more than 313 million were distributed in 1993. The company's specialty retail stores also performed well in 1993 generating $840 million in sales. In 1994 Spiegel formed a joint venture with Time Warner Entertainment to create two home shopping services for cable television. One of the services was named Catalog One and was planned as a one-channel showcase for a roster of numerous upscale catalog retailers each of which would sell its goods using innovative entertainment style shows. Participants in Catalog One in 1994 besides Spiegel and Eddie Bauer were the Bombay Company Crate and Barrel the Nature Company Neiman Marcus the Sharper Image Viewers Edge and Williams Sonoma. The channel was tested in five markets that year Rochester, New York, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Nashua, New Hampshire, Columbus, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Spiegel also teamed up with Lillian Vernon Lands and other catalogers in 1994 to create a CD-ROM catalog. The company formed a partnership with MCI Communications Corporation that was aimed at increasing both companies' customer bases. MCI began offering a $35 Spiegel gift certificate to any customer who changed his or her long-distance telephone service to MCI. MCI also offered an additional $20 certificate to any customer who remained an MCI user for at least six months. Around this time Spiegel considered entering the electronic shopping market through an online service such as AOL. This was realized in 1995 but at the expense of the year-old Catalog One venture. By this time Catalog One had begun airing in three more test markets raising its total presence to eight cities. Time Warner and Spiegel decided however there was greater potential gain in launching a website for Catalog One and capitalizing of the internet. Accordingly they scaled back their cable television operation to work on a homepage through Time Warner's popular Pathfinder site. Spiegel also initiated an entrance into the Canadian market in 1995 and planned to distribute its catalogue there by the spring of 1996. Previous strong Eddie Bauer business in Canada aided the company's decision to move in on a larger scale as did the company's good distribution agreements in Canada. Eddie Bauer was also performing well in Japan where the company had built many retail stores throughout the previous years. The year 1996 marked the most profitable year in Eddie Bauer's history and Spiegel's revenues benefited. Eddie Bauer's merchandise was popular enough that the company encountered issues with out-of-stock merchandise occurrences a direct result of high consumer demand. Spiegel achieved $3.06 billion in 1997 revenue with approximately $1.8 billion from its Eddie Bauer operations. 
regardless of Eddie Bauer's contribution to its parent company however the subsidiary had a difficult fiscal year. Following the increase in demand for its products in 1996 the company overproduced and overstocked in 1997. In addition the newer Eddie Bauer merchandise offerings were not as popular as 1996 thus the company was left in oversupply of merchandise. In the August 17, 1998 issue of the Puget Sound Business Journal Eddie Bauer's president and CEO Rick Fersh commented on the company's problems, we were overplanned, overstocked, overstyled, overcolored and it was overwarm and that meant trouble. The year 1998 brought additional challenges for Eddie Bauer and subsequently for Bauer's parent company. Warmer than usual winter weather brought about by a highly publicized weather phenomenon known as El Nino hurt sales figures. Spiegel's overall revenues for the year dropped to $2.94 billion as a result. Spiegel set out to halt its downward spiral and achieve profitability again. The company redesigned its main catalog which in prior years had become something of an amalgam of differing and often conflicting items and images. The company created a catalog solely to target the working woman and organized its main catalog so as not to place $1,000 designer outfits adjacent to $20 casual shirts for example. Eddie Bauer also launched efforts to get itself back on track. By the end of the year Spiegel announced they had improved earnings. Although its revenue decreased during 1998 the company turned a profit and achieved positive cash flow according to a fiscal year-end document released by Spiegel in early 1999. Eddie Bauer's performance disappointed again during the year but Spiegel's other subsidiary catalog Newport News posted solid results. After years of shrinking economic fortunes the company suffered large financial losses and changed ownership three times within the early 2000s. In 2003 Spiegel filed for bankruptcy and reorganization under the bankruptcy code. This included closing 60 Eddie Bauer stores. In 2004 a group headed by Golden Gate Capital Partners and Pangea Holdings Ltd. purchased the Spiegel and Newport News catalog businesses. At the same time the existing reorganizing company retained its Eddie Bauer unit and eventually assumed the subsidiary name as the company name. From 2004 Spiegel Catalog and the women's fashion catalog Newport News operated under the name Spiegel Brands Inc. In 2008 Spiegel was sold again to an investment group led by Granite Creek Partners. In June 2009 Spiegel was sold again to private equity fund Patriarch Partners LLC and then operated under the name Spiegel LLC having done business from 2009 to 2012 as Signature Styles LLC and Artemis LLC respectively. Spiegel's headquarters were then moved to New York City from Chicago. In 2012 the leadership at Spiegel was replaced when the company discontinued its catalog in favor of digital marketing. In 2016 Spiegel announced it would become the first American fashion digital catalog to feature a transgender model on its cover when Arizi Wanzer was selected. At the same time a number of other patriarch partner companies had begun abruptly shutting down without notice. A number of lawsuits were ultimately filed against patriarch and civil fraud allegations were leveled by the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Ultimately during the winter of 2019 Spiegel's website was removed and the company abruptly ceased all operations. A&P Supermarket The Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company better known as A&P was an American chain of grocery stores that operated from 1859 to 2015. From 1915 through 1975 A&P was the largest grocery retailer in the United States, and until 1965 the largest USA retailer of any kind. A&P was considered an American icon that according to the Wall Street Journal was as well known as McDonald's or Google is today and was the Walmart before Walmart at its peak in the 1940s A&P captured 10% of total US grocery spending. Known for innovation A&P and the supermarkets that followed its lead improved nutritional habits by making available a vast assortment of food products at much lower costs.
Until 1982 ANP also was a large food manufacturer. Founded in 1859 by George Gilman as Gilman and Company within a few years the firm opened a small chain of retail tea and coffee stores in New York City and operated a national mail order business. The firm grew to 70 stores by 1878 when Gilman passed management to George Huntington Hartford who turned A&P into the country's first grocery chain. In 1900 it operated almost 200 stores. After Hartford acquired ownership A&P grew dramatically by introducing the economy store concept in 1912 growing to 1,600 stores in 1915. After World War I it added stores that offered meat and produce while expanding manufacturing. In 1930 A&P now the world's largest retailer reached $2.9 billion in sales. $44.4 billion today, with 16,000 stores. In 1936 it adopted the self-serve supermarket concept and opened 4,000 larger stores, While phasing out many of its smaller units, by 1950, A&P's decline began in the early 1950s when it failed to keep pace with competitors that opened larger supermarkets with more modern features demanded by customers. By the 1970s A&P stores were outdated and its efforts to combat high operating costs resulted in poor customer service. In 1975 it hired outside management, closed older stores and built modern ones. When these efforts failed to turn A&P around the heirs of the Hartford family and the Hartford Foundation which owned a majority of the stock sold to the Tengel Mann Group of Germany. In 1981 A&P launched its second store closing program financed by the surplus assets of its employee pension plan reducing the corporation to fewer than 1,000 stores. The plan also closed manufacturing operations except coffee production. Starting in 1982 A&P acquired several chains that continued to be operated under their own names rather than being converted to A&P. While A&P regained profitability in the 1980s in 2002 it operated at a record loss because of new competition especially from Walmart. A&P closed more stores which included the sale of its large Canadian division. A&P also spun off 8 o'clock coffee the last of its manufacturing units. In 2007 A&P purchased Pathmark one of its biggest rivals and A&P again became the largest supermarket operator in the New York City area. At the same time Tenjil Man reduced its shares to 38.5% while the private equity firm Ukaipa as major shareholder of Pathmark acquired 27.5% of A&P's shares. Highly leveraged after the Pathmark acquisition A&P experienced financial difficulties because of the Great Recession and filed for Chapter 11 protection in 2010 in the United States Bankruptcy Court in White Plains, New York. By the time of its filing A&P had declined from the nation's largest grocery retailer to the 28th with operations limited to the Northeast. In 2012 A&P emerged from bankruptcy by becoming a private company as Tenjil Man ended its holding, and briefly returned to modest profitability in 2013 and 2014. 
ANP had been for sale in 2013 but could not find a suitable buyer. After declaring a loss in April 2015 it filed for its second Chapter 11 bankruptcy on July 19 of that year. All of its supermarkets were sold or closed by November 25, 2015 and the closure of the best sellers wines and spirits stores followed shortly thereafter, with those stores auctioned in August 2016. Consumers Distributing The first Consumers Distributing store was opened in 1957 by Jack Stupp and Sidney Druckmann in Toronto. The company was taken public in 1969. In 1978 Oshawa Group sold the 50% interest it had acquired. In 1988 revenues topped $1 billion. Consumers Distributing purchased the 42-store Cardinal Distributors catalog chain from Steinberg Inc. and the 70-store American chain Consumers from May Department Stores bringing its total store count to approximately 400 in 1981. During the 1980s, Consumers Distributing built a chain of toy stores called Toy City, Toyville in Quebec. In 1990 and 1991 some stores became Toy City slash consumers distributing stores. They closed in the mid-1990s. In 1990s. Consumers Distributing was bought by the Quebec-based grocery retailer Provigo in 1987 then was sold in 1993 to a group controlled by Ackermans and Van Haren a Belgian holding company. In the 1990s Consumers Distributing Inc struggled to compete with Zellers and then Walmart Canada. Consumers Distributing sought bankruptcy protection in 1996. Ten years following the bankruptcy former Consumers Distributing employee marking relaunched the company as an online retailer. The new Consumers Distributing website operated in the run-up to the 2012 holiday season taking orders for furniture and brand name electronics but the site was shuttered in January 2013 and King was accused of owing back wages to employees. In May 2015 the company was issued a compliance order by Consumer Protection BC for deceptive acts and practices and for failing to issue refunds. The regulator reopened the investigation in October 2016 when it received a new complaint noting that the company still had not paid penalties from the prior investigation. The main focus of the retailer was jewelry appliances kitchenware toys personal care discount furniture electronics and seasonal goods. The retail store layout consisted of a series of glass cabinets that displayed merchandise. Customers were for the most part required to select their products from catalogs that were located throughout the store filling out a request form for the item they desired. This form was given to a store clerk and processed for fulfillment with the goods stored in non-public space in a warehouse system stock area behind the counters. There were two main catalog launches per year with seasonal mini catalogs issued more frequently to highlight certain items. The entire line changed twice a year with few exceptions. New items were introduced only with a new catalog. A few specialty lines such as batteries film and some jewelry lines on counter racks and were not found in the catalog. Photo processing was another service available in many stores. Hudson's Bay Company which operates Canadian department stores under the Bay End, Formerly, Zeller's Names acquired the small ShopRite catalog chain in 1972 and quickly expanded it in an attempt to compete with consumers distributing. The chain never reached profitability and ceased operations in 1982. A 
American competition was mainly from the catalog showroom retail store chain's Best Products, also known simply as Best, and Service Merchandise. Both Best Products and Service Merchandise ultimately declared bankruptcy and ceased operations. Argos which was modeled on the format of consumers distributing continues to thrive in Ireland and the United Kingdom. Consumers distributing was plagued by the perception that items were frequently out of stock due to the catalog shopping nature of the store. With the catalog concept, the customer selected the item either at home while looking through the company's catalog, or by a group of catalogs in the showroom of every store. It was not uncommon for a customer to wait in line only to be told by a clerk that the merchandise was not in stock. In 1984 a concept called the flashboard was introduced. The flashboard was a steel bulletin board with magnetic catalog numbers for out-of-stock items. Customers were able to look at the flashboard for their item and if it was listed they knew that it was out of stock and they did not have to wait in line. This concept was used in some New York and New Jersey stores before computerization became mainstream. Consumers distributing undertook several initiatives to dispel this out-of-stock perception, including superstores that had all of the in-stock products on display and free home delivery or store-to-store -store transfer for items that were not in stock. It also implemented a state-of-the-art inventory system that could check the availability of other stores in real time and also would suggest alternate products at the store which were in stock. Consumers Distributing was one of the first to implement real-time stock checking and prepayment for products available at other branches and the main warehouse. These initiatives including the Superstore expansion costly free delivery and costly new inventory management software overextended the company. High operating expenses increasing competition changing retailing trends such as warehouse format stores, deflation in several product categories, jewelry and electronics, a deep lingering recession and the expansion of Walmart into Canada all contributed to the company's bankruptcy in 1996. Food Fair aka Pantry Pride Samuel Friedland opened his first reading giant quality price cutter supermarket in the 1920s. The success of the first store led to the opening of more stores. In the late 1940s came the introduction of the name Food Fair. In 1958 Food Fair purchased Setzer's Supermarkets a 38 store chain in the Jacksonville, Florida area. In 1961 Food Fair bought J.M. Fields Department Stores a chain of discount department stores in New England. The latter chain grew substantially, expanding to areas already served by Food Fair, particularly in Florida. By the 1960s most J.M. Fields stores featured a J.M. Fields Food Fair or Pantry Pride grocery store. During the 1960s, Food Fair enjoyed great success, but the most significant purchase for the company was that of a small Philadelphia chain called Best Markets. Best's private label brand was called Pantry Pride. The first Pantry Pride store opened its doors at 9 a.m. on August 26, 1964 in Hazlitt, New Jersey test running a no-frills discount store approach. Soon the stores that were under the Pantry Pride logo eventually became more popular than the Food Fair brand. By the early 1970s Food Fair had converted most of its stores to the Pantry Pride banner and the company popularity grew further. In the late 1960s, the company led by its Pantry Pride stores continued to grow. The company also opened additional J.M. Fields stores and entered new businesses, launching drug stores, gasoline stations and shoe stores. It also boosted its core business by entering California and Nevada through the purchase of the Fox Markets chain. The western expansion proved exhausting for the predominantly East Coast retailer eventually divesting the 50 stores by 1972. In 1976 Pantry Pride acquired Hills supermarkets of New York. Later that year Pantry Pride purchased the remaining 17 stores of Philadelphia-based Penfruit Company.
In 1978 Food Fair fell victim to financial problems. The company entered bankruptcy that year and a new management team led by supermarket veteran Grant Gentry began streamlining the 456 store $2.7 billion company. By the end of 1978 the company took the first steps in the long journey out of bankruptcy by closing all of the JM Fields stores. Those stores were quickly purchased by Caldor Jefferson Ward and Kmart. In early 1979 the company left their home market market of Philadelphia, where the firm was headquartered. The company closed more than 50 stores in the area even though they were the second largest chain in Greater Philadelphia in terms of market share. Between 1979 and 1981 more than 200 stores were closed along with several warehouses. Food Arama bought 14 of the 48 Baltimore area stores in 1981. By this time, Food Fair had emerged from bankruptcy and was based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida under the name Pantry Pride Stores Incorporated. The company had entered into talks to be purchased by Pathmark stores that same year but discussions were abandoned when Pantry Pride stockholders filed a complaint. Pantry Pride outsourced their wholesale operations to SuperValue when they sold their Miami and Jacksonville distribution centers. The company then began selling off huge chunks of their assets when they sold two-thirds of their remaining stores including the last of their Richmond, Virginia stores to ANP which continued to operate the stores under the Pantry Pride banner until 1986. Only about 40 stores in southern Florida remained. In 1984 Pantry Pride acquired Devon Stores a home improvement store and the 400 store Adams Drug Company which operated in the northeastern United States. The owner of Devon Stores, who obtained about 10.4% of the merged company then sought an ouster of the Pantry Pride Board of Directors. In 1985 using junk bonds 38% of Pantry Pride was acquired by investor Ronald Perlman. This was enough to acquire control and Perlman liquidated their assets but kept the losses on the books to offset profits from McAndrews and Forbes which he had previously acquired. Perlman used Pantry Pride as a vehicle to acquire other companies in particular Revlon. By 1986, the name of Pantry Pride was changed to Revlon Group. The Delaware Supreme Court decision relating to the takeover of Revlon by Pantry Pride Revlon Incorporated v. McAndrews and Forbes Holdings Incorporated has become a seminal case in American takeover law. In 1985 the last stores in southern Florida were sold to Red Apple Group a New York supermarket chain owned by John Katsimatidis. By 1990 the chain was being supplied by the Fleming companies. The last store opened in 1991 in Sunny Isles, Florida. By this time, nearly all of the stores were renamed Woolies, after Bill Woolley acquired the latter named chain of seven stores in the late 1980s. In 1993 Fleming bought the Woolies chain after a dispute with Katsimatidis. The remaining stores were either closed or sold by 2000. Many of the stores that were sold have retained the Food Fair name under the new ownership. An unrelated chain using the Food Fair Fresh Market name has operated in the New York City metropolitan area since 2009 and is a member of Key Food. Gimbals The company was founded by a young Bavarian Jewish immigrant Adam Gimbel who opened a general store in Vincennes, Indiana. After a brief stay in Danville, Illinois Gimbel relocated in 1887 to Milwaukee, Wisconsin which was then a boomtown heavily populated by German immigrants. The new store quickly became the leading department store there. However with seven sons Adam Gimbel saw the opportunity to expand elsewhere. In 1894 Gimbel's then led by the founder's son Isaac Gimbel acquired the Granville Haynes store, originally built and operated by Cooper and Conard, 
in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and in 1910 opened another branch in New York City. With its arrival in New York Gimbel's prospered and soon became the primary rival to the leading Herald Square retailer Macy's whose flagship store was located a block north. This rivalry entered into the American popular Argo as does Macy's Tell Gimbel's, an idiom used to brush off any query about matters the speaker didn't wish to divulge. To distinguish itself from Herald Square neighbors Gimbel's advertising promised more, select don't settle. Gimbel's became so successful that in 1922 the chain went public offering shares on the New York Stock Exchange, though the family retained a controlling interest. The stock sales provided capital for expansion starting with the 1923 purchase of across-the-street rival Saks & Co which operated under the name Saks 34th Street with ownership of Saks Gimbel created an uptown branch called Saks 5th Avenue. Moving into radio Gimbel's purchased WGBS in New York and WIP in Philadelphia. In 1925 Gimbel's entered the Pittsburgh market with the purchase of Kaufman and Bayer's acquiring WCAE in the deal. Although expansion spurred talk of the stores becoming a nationwide chain the Great Depression ended that prospect. Gimbel did increase the number of more upscale and enormously profitable Saks Fifth Avenue stores in the 1930s opening branches in Chicago, Boston and San Francisco. By 1930 Gimbel's had seven flagship stores throughout the country and sales of $123 million across 20 stores this made Gimbel Brothers Incorporated the largest department store corporation in the world. By 1953 sales had risen to $300 million. In 1962 Gimbel's acquired Milwaukee competitor Schuster's and in that region operated stores from both chains for a while as Gimbel's Schuster's. By 1965 Gimbel Brothers Incorporated consisted of 53 stores throughout the country which included 22 Gimbel's 27, Saks Fifth Avenue stores and 4 Saks 34th ST. Gimbel's principles and merchandise sought to reflect the ideals of middle-class America. Their principles consisted of courtesy reliability good value and enlightened management. By using middle-class values Gimbel's attracted shoppers to a store that also could fit their budgets. Keeping the store plain and less extravagant than some of its competitors Gimbel's used the slogan the customer pays for fancy frills. Gimbel's was about the product not the aesthetics. By offering a wide range of cutting-edge technology in its merchandise Gimbel's reflected the ideals held by the middle class of staying up to date with technologies and carrying new appliances and merchandise at an affordable price. Gimbel's department store offered a variety of merchandise and products including home appliances, outdoor equipment, furniture, clothing and much more. With multiple floors in its flagship stores each floor offered a given category of merchandise. The Philadelphia Gimbel's specifically offered fine jewelry, men's clothing, women's clothing, children's clothing, furniture, toys, art supplies and appliances for the house. This store also contained the Gimbel Auditorium Television Headquarters, a salon and music center. With a wide variety of options Gimbel's was a one stop shop that made shopping easy and accessible. Despite its limited presence Gimbel's was well known nationwide in part because of the carefully cultivated rivalry with Macy's but also thanks to an endless stream of publicity. The New York store received considerable attention as the site of the 1939-40 sale of art and antiquities from the William Randolph Hearst collection. Gimbel's also gained publicity from the 1947 film Miracle on 34th Street. The 1967 film Fitz Willie and was frequently mentioned as a shopping destination of Lucy Ricardo and Ethel Mer on the hit 1950s TV series I Love Lucy. The Slinky made its debut at the Northeast Philadelphia Gimbel's store. Also the Philadelphia Gimbel's was the first department store in the world to move customers from floor to floor via the escalator.
The idea of a department store parade originated in 1920 with Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia with the parade now known as the 6 ABC Dunkin' Donuts Thanksgiving Day Parade. The Gimbel family saw the parade as a way to promote holiday shopping at its various store locations. Macy's did not start a parade until 1924, when Gimbel ceased operating in 1986 television station WPVI assumed responsibility for the parade with sponsorship by Dunkin' Donuts is the chief sponsor of the parade. Brown & Williamson The American subsidiary of British American Tobacco a diversified conglomerate based in Louisville, Kentucky acquired Gimbel's in 1973. Brown & Williamson also owned Marshall Fields, purchased in 1982, Frederick & Nelson The Crescent Stores & Coles, purchased in 1972. Brown & Williamson later created the Betis Retail Group as a subsidiary company for its retail holdings. Betis initially left the Gimbel's chain in the four autonomous divisions that had been established under Gimbel family ownership Gimbel's New York, Gimbel's Philadelphia, Gimbel's Pittsburgh and Gimbel's Milwaukee. Each division operated independently of each other in advertising and buying. Each division offered their own charge card which could only be used at Gimbel's stores in the same division. In 1983 Gimbel's New York and Gimbel's Philadelphia were combined into a single entity Gimbel's East in an attempt to reduce corporate overhead. Deciding that Gimbel's was a marginal performer with little potential for increased profitability Betis in 1986 decided to close its Gimbel's division and sell its store properties. Some of the more attractive branches were taken over by Stearns, Allied Stores, Pomeroy's, Allied Stores, Kaufman's, May Department Stores, or PA, Bergner & Co.'s Boston Store. The cornerstone of the chain the downtown Milwaukee store where Adam Gimbel had first found success and alleged to be the most profitable Gimbel store was handed to Beta System division Marshall Fields but eventually closed in 1997. The downtown Milwaukee building was remodeled in 1998 and now houses a fitness club formerly a Borders, the headquarters of the American Society for Quality along with other offices and a 131-room extended stay hotel. Gino's Hamburgers In 1957, Baltimore Colts football players Alan Amich and Joe Campanella, along with Louis Fisher, opened a hamburger restaurant at 4009 North Point Road in Dundalk, Maryland just outside of Baltimore. Soon several other stores were added in the Baltimore area. In 1959, the trio was joined by Colts captain Gino Marchetti, and the chain became known as Gino's Drive-In. Within a year the company went public to secure funds for expansion and began to reach up the East Coast into New England and as far south as North Carolina. Geno's did not franchise each store was company owned and operated. Geno's was distinguished for its philanthropic efforts aimed at helping young people. Executives of the company supported many educational, cultural, recreational and athletic projects. By 1969 there were 100 Gino's restaurants growing to 330 in 1972. In 1978 there were 359 Gino's stores. Gino's was the outlet for Kentucky Fried Chicken in the areas they operated. Gino's feature sandwich was the Gino Giant dubbed a banquet on a bun. In the early 1970s the chain found an opportunity for growth by merging with the 18-unit Topps drive-in chain in Northern Virginia and adopting Topps line of sirloiner burgers. In 1976 Gino's retired the Giant sandwich and replaced it with the Gino Hero. The Hero turned out to be unsuccessful and led Gino's to return the Giant. Prize fighter Muhammad Ali was hired 
hired to film a TV commercial to announce the Giants return. In 1978 salad combo platters were added to the lineup along with salad bars also added were drive through windows at some locations. Also in 1978 the unsuccessful Gino Hero sandwich was added to the menu. It is said the hero was one of the reasons for Gino's downfall. Around 1980 cheese take sandwiches became available along with a line of breakfasts. Around 1981 Gino's made the unfortunate decision to discontinue the trademark giant sirloiner and hamburger slash cheeseburger and replace the line with an all new menu that included home style hamburgers roast beef chili and junior burgers. Along with the new menu 10 colored awnings were added to the exterior of the Gino's buildings and carpeting was installed in some of the interior spaces. Realizing the mistake of discontinuing the famous giant the sandwich was reinstated in 1983. Gino's ran TV commercials that featured comedian Soupy Sales and Don DeLuise who played the Gino Genie. Over the years Gino's advertising slogans were Everybody goes to Gino's during the 1960s into the 70s Gino's, only Gino's in the 1970s and Gino's gives you freedom of choice as a bicentennial theme in 1976. In the early 1970s Geno's purchased the Rustler Steakhouse chain which was founded by Joe Campanella in Baltimore. Rustler featured top quality steak meals at budget prices. Many Rustler locations were then located next to Geno's restaurants. The Rustler buildings featured an Old West exterior and Frontier interior. Meals were usually served cafeteria style by staff dressed in Western outfits. By 1972 there were 14 Rustler restaurants growing to 147 by the end of 19. In early 1982 Geno's by this time headquartered in the Philadelphia suburbs, was sold to the Marriott Corporation. Marriott purchased the chain to increase the presence of its Roy Rogers restaurant chain. With this, 180 of the 313 Geno's locations were converted to Roy Rogers outlets. The remaining stores those with an existing Roy Rogers nearby or poor locations were closed and sold. The dismantling of the Geno's chain opened the areas they operated into Kentucky Fried Chicken, which allowed KFC operate their own stores where previously Geno's held the rights to sell KFC. KFC purchased many former Geno's from Marriott and began a major expansion in these areas. Marriott sold the Rustler chain in early 1983 to 108 locations to Tenley Enterprises which was a newly founded company and the remainder of the Rustler locations were sold to Collins Foods and were converted to Sizzler Steakhouses. Today a lot of the people who worked for Gino stay in touch with each other and in 2002 held a get together at a former manager's home with over 120 Gino's alumni attending from all over the country. Gino's is remembered by these people as being a very unique and wonderful company to work for. In 2010 Marchetti, Romano, and Fisher have opened several new Gino's restaurants. Marchetti and Fisher will be serving as consultants. The new restaurants plan to serve burgers, chicken sandwiches, hand-cut French fries and hand-spun milkshakes. Initially, the chain plans to open locations in Pennsylvania and Maryland. In charge is Tom Romano who worked for 20 years with the company and was COO in 1982 when the chain was sold, it's apparent there's a need for better burgers out there said Romano citing the success of such chains as Five Guys and Gino's Burgers and Chicken has placed itself upscale of the earlier Gino's. Gino's plans to make its burgers to order from fresh beef. Their first location opened in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania the same town as the original chain's headquarters on October 25, 2010. Plans were announced in spring 2011 for franchise expansion into Baltimore. On August 17, 2011 a second Geno's location opened in Towson, Maryland. Another Geno's opened in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania on October 11, 2011. A Geno's Burgers and Chicken opened in Oriole Park at Camden Yards at the start of the Oriole season in 2012 but closed by the end of the 2014 season. On January 22, 
2013 Geno's Burgers and Chicken opened in Aberdeen, Maryland, however the Ben Salem location closed around the same time. Later, on July 9, 2013 the King of Prussia location closed, effectively leaving the Philadelphia market. The location at Perry Hall, Maryland which opened on March 5, 2012 closed on December 8, 2013. The Aberdeen location closed on March 27, 2016 leaving only the Towson and Glen Burnie locations. John Wanamaker John Wanamaker was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1838. Due to a persistent cough he was unable to join the U.S. Army to fight in the American Civil War so instead started a career in business. In 1861 he and his brother-in-law Nathan Brown founded a men's clothing store in Philadelphia called Oak Hall. Wanamaker carried on the business alone after Brown's death in 1868. Eight years later Wanamaker purchased the abandoned Pennsylvania Railroad Station for use as a new larger retail location. The concept was to renovate the terminal into a grand depot similar to London's Royal Exchange or Paris's Les Halles two central markets and forerunners of the modern department store that were well known in Europe at that time. The Wanamaker's Grand Depot opened in time to service the public visiting Philadelphia for the American Centennial Exposition of 1876 and in fact resembled one of the many pavilions at that World's Fair because of its fanciful new Moorish facade. In 1877 the interior of Wanamaker's was refurbished and expanded to include not only men's clothing but women's clothing and dry goods as well. This was Philadelphia's first modern-day department store and one of the earliest founded in America. A circular counter was placed at the center of the building and concentric circles radiated around it with 129 counters of goods. The store also accepted mail orders though it was not a large business until the early 20th century. Wanamaker first thought of how he would run a store on new principles when as a youth a merchant refused his request to exchange a purchase. A practicing Christian he chose not to advertise on Sundays. Before he opened his Grand Depot for retail business he let evangelist Dwight L. Moody use its facilities as a meeting place while Wanamaker provided 300 ushers from his store personnel. His retail advertisements the first to be copyrighted beginning in 1874 were factual and promises made in them were kept. Wanamaker guaranteed the quality of his merchandise in print allowed his customers to return purchases for a cash refund and offered the first restaurant to be located inside a department store. Wanamaker also invented the price tag. His employees were to be treated respectfully by management and John Wanamaker and Company offered its employees access to the John Wanamaker Commercial Institute as well as free medical care recreational facilities profit sharing plans and pensions long before these types of benefits were considered standard in corporate employment. Innovation and firsts marked Wanamaker's, the store was the first department store with electrical illumination, first store with a telephone, and the first store to install pneumatic tubes to transport cash and documents. Wanamaker's commissioned a Philadelphia-slash-New Jersey artist George Washington Nicholson, 1832-1912, to paint a large landscape mural the old homestead which was finished in March 1892. The 7-by-14-foot mural was still owned by Wanamaker's in 1950 but has since passed into a private collection. In 1910 Wanamaker replaced his Grand Depot in stages, and constructed a new, purpose-built structure on the same site in Center City, Philadelphia. The new store, built in the Florentine style with granite walls by Chicago architect Daniel H. Burnham, had 12 floors numerous galleries and two lower levels totaling nearly 2 million square feet. The palatial emporium featured the Wanamaker organ the former St. Louis World's Fair pipe organ at the time one of the world's largest organs.
The organ was installed in the store's marble-clad central atrium known as the Grand Court. Another item from the St. Louis Fair in the Grand Court is the large bronze eagle which quickly became the symbol of the store and a favorite meeting place for shoppers. All one had to say was meet you at the eagle and everyone knew where to go. The store was dedicated by President William Howard Taft on December 13, 1911. Despite its size the organ was deemed insufficient to fill the Grand Court with its music. Wanamakers responded by assembling its own staff of organ builders and expanding the organ several times over a period of years. The Wanamaker organ is the largest fully operational pipe organ in the world with some 28,750 pipes. It is famed for the delicate orchestra-like beauty of its tone as well as its incredible power. The organ still stands in place in the store today and free recitals are held twice every day except Sunday. Day. Visitors are also invited to tour the organ's console area and meet with staff after recitals. Once a year usually in June Wanamaker Organ Day is held which is a free recital which lasts most of the day. News of the Titanic sinking was transmitted to Wanamaker's wireless station in New York City and given to anxious crowds waiting outside yet another first for an American retail store. Public Christmas caroling in the store's grand court began in 1918. In 1919 El Mundo a Spanish newspaper said of its New York store that it was 100 special departments all under one roof including the Department of Personal Service for Latin Americans. Other innovations included employing buyers to travel overseas to Europe each year for the latest fashions, the first white sale, and other themed sales such as the February Opportunity Sales to keep prices as low as possible while keeping volume high. The store also broadcast its organ concerts on the Wanamaker-owned radio station WOO beginning in 1922. Under the leadership of James Bayard Woodford, Wanamaker's opened piano stores in Philadelphia and New York that did a huge business with an innovative fixed-price system of sales. Salons in period decor were used to sell the higher price items. Wanamaker also tried selling small organs built by the Austin Organ Company for a time. After John Wanamaker's death in 1922 the business carried on under Wanamaker family ownership. Rodman Wanamaker John's son enhanced the reputation of the stores as artistic centers and temples of the beautiful offering imported luxuries from around the world. After his death in 1928 the stores continued to thrive for a time. The men's clothing and accessories department was expanded into its own separate store on the lower floors of the Lincoln Liberty building two doors down on Chestnut Street in 1932. This building which also had had a private apartment for the Wanamaker family on its top floor was sold to Philadelphia National Bank in 1952 the initials on the building's crown read PNB until November 2014 even though the bank no longer existed PNB was acquired by Core States which was then acquired by First Union which was rebranded as Wachovia Bank after acquiring Wachovia Corporation and later acquired by Wells Fargo and Company over time Wanamaker's lost business to other retail chains including Bloomingdale's and Macy's in the the Philadelphia market. The Wanamaker Family Trust finally sold John Wanamaker and Company with its under-patronized stores to Los Angeles, California-based Carter Holly Hale Stores for 60 million US dollar cash in 1978. Carter Holly Hale poured another 80 million dollars into renovating the stores but to no avail customers had gone elsewhere in the intervening decades and did not come back. Finally, in 1986 the now 15 store chain was sold to Woodward and Lothrop owned by Detroit's hopping mall magnate A. Alfred Taugman. Taugman reorganized the business with a shortened corporate name, Wanamakers Incorporated, and poured millions more into store renovations and public relations campaigns. This too was no help as Taugman's retail interests were heavily in debt and the store's combined sales were a disappointment. Believing that the Wanamaker building space was more valuable than portions of the historic Wanamaker store the Philadelphia Philadelphia flagship store was reduced to its first five stories, the Juniper Street side became the lobby of an office building for the upper stories and the former basement budget downstairs store became a parking garage, the Crystal Tea Room restaurant was closed and eventually leased to the Marriott Corporation for use as a ballroom. Personal effects of Mr. Wanamaker from his until then preserved office on the 8th floor and the store archives were donated to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Beloved huge Easter paintings of the trial and passion of the Christ by Mihaly Munkoxy that had been personal favorites of Mr. 
Mr. Wanamaker and were displayed every year in the Grand Court during Lent were unceremoniously sold at auction. Woodward and Lothrop collapsed in bankruptcy filing for Chapter 11 on January 17, 1994 and with it the Wanamaker stores which were sold to May Department Stores Company on June 21, 1995. Wanamaker's Incorporated was formally dissolved and operations were consolidated with May's Hex Division in Arlington, Virginia. After 133 consecutive years, the Wanamaker's name was removed from all stores and replaced with Hex. In 1997 May acquired Wanamaker historic rival Strawbridge and Clothier and rebranded all Philadelphia area Hex locations with the Strawbridge's name. The Center City Hex, temporarily named Strawbridge's, was closed for a lengthy renovation and refurbishment that saw the former Wanamaker retail space reduced in size again to three floors and the former selling floors on the upper floors further subdivided into commercial office space. This was to prepare the way in 1997 for New York-based Lord & Taylor, another division of May department stores to open in the the former Wanamaker's flagship in Center City, Philadelphia. In August 2006 the store was converted to Macy's operated by the Macy's East Division of Federated Department Stores Inc. Now Macy's Incorporated, which acquired May in late 2005. The New York Wanamaker store on Broadway was replaced by Kmart by 1996. The store was not immune to the major change in retailing away from regional chains to national chains. The uniformity of brand offerings and the cost savings available to national chains all worked against the viability of the store as an independent personality although customers generally had a major say in determining store offerings and the magnificence of its commercial space did tend to cause it to be stocked with better offerings. Other retailers had also learned to offer goods with much smaller staff rosters. The ability of retailers to go national in opposite Opposition to regional tastes is still an experiment in progress with mixed results. The Wanamaker's flagship store with its famous organ and eagle from the St. Louis World's Fair was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1978. Retailers continue to reap significant monetary returns from the elegance of this unparalleled retail space. In 1992 a non-profit group the Friends of the Wanamaker Organ was founded to promote the preservation, restoration and presentation of the famous pipe organ. As a retail site the Philadelphia flagship store has proved quite profitable for later tenants Lord & Taylor and now Macy's. With a long tradition of parades and fireworks displays Macy's has taken a prominent civic role in fostering historic Wanamaker traditions, especially the Wanamaker organ and the holiday pageant of Light's Christmas show. In 2008 Macy's celebrated its 150th birthday in the Philadelphia flagship store with a concert featuring the Wanamaker organ and the Philadelphia orchestra that attracted a capacity city audience. In 1956 the Philadelphia Wanamakers premiered a Christmas light show, a large musical and blinking light display several stories high viewable from several levels of the building but with the best viewing on the central ground floor. Its popularity with Philadelphia parents and children as well as tourists ensured a continuous run even after the building was sold to different business interests. For decades until 1994 the melodic baritone voice or narrator of the show was John Fursenda known to Philadelphia's for decades reporting the news on radio and television, as well as nationally known as the voice of NFL Films. NFL Films' Ed Saville referred to Fursenda as the voice of God his words mything and dramatic baritone delivery were highlights of the shows and did much to boost Fursenda's stock and mystique. Various announcers narrated the show between 1995 and 2005, beginning in 2000. 2006, under Macy's, Julie Andrews became the show's narrator. Also in 2006 the Santa Express train at the top of the Grand Court returned. In 2007 the entire Christmas light show was completely modernized and rebuilt by Macy's Parade Studio on new trusses with lighter materials and LED lighting. In 2008 a new and bigger magic Christmas tree with LED lights debuted. However due to safety concerns and logistical issues the dancing water fountains were retired and will not return. Sambos
In 1957 two white men from Southern California were brainstorming a name for their new restaurant. Sam Battistone Sr. was a short compact and determined looking man who had run a diner in downtown Santa Barbara for two decades. Newell Bonnet was a 34 year old equipment salesman whose father had been the mayor of Santa Barbara. They wanted a name that was catchy and that would be familiar to the working and middle class families they hoped to cater to. Combining Battistone's first name with the first two letters of Bonnet's last name they christened their new establishment Sambos. The first Sambos Pancake House opened on June 17, 1957 on beachfront Cabrillo Boulevard in downtown Santa Barbara. True to their rather clunky slogan what this country needs is a good 10 cent cup of coffee the restaurant offered bottomless, inexpensive cups of joe. A full breakfast was only $1.25. Sambo soon began attracting a large number of customers, particularly at breakfast. From the beginning Battistone and Bonnet worked hard to foster a familial feeling at Sambo's from the clientele to the employees. According to Charles Bernstein, author of Sambo's Only a Fraction of the Action, Sambo's initial summer days in 1957 were especially exciting. Early each morning Sam Sr. with his sleeves rolled up would be busy cooking at one grill while his 17-year-old just graduated son was cooking at the other one, and his wife was serving breakfast to whatever customers happened to arrive. The family and Bonnet were counting on an array of 21 different pancakes and a few other choice offerings to keep the 45 counter and booth seats reasonably full. The good vibes also extended between the partners with Bonnet later recalling next to my marriage my association with Sam Battistone Sr. was one of the most pleasurable and gratifying associations that I have ever experienced. The men prided themselves on the warm atmosphere and decoration at their flagship restaurant, its design was bright and cheerful there were tantalizing views of the ocean and the piped in music was soothing and soft. However, no matter how welcoming the atmosphere, there was a large portion of the population who would never feel at home at the restaurant, for on the walls were seven paintings of the story of Little Black Sambo. Not to mention, the name Sambo's itself signaled to people of color that they were not welcome at the restaurant. By 1957 the name Sambo already had a long and controversial history. Since as far back as the 1500s the name had been used to denote a black man. By the 19th century Sambo had become an archetypal degrading character in literature and minstrel shows. Sambo the typical plantation slave was docile but irresponsible loyal but lazy humble but chronically given to lying and stealing historian Stanley Elkins wrote. His behavior was full of infantile silliness and his talk inflated with childish exaggeration. Education specialist Jesse Bertha explained that the end man in the minstrel show The Stupid One Who Was the Butt of All the Jokes was Sambo. The paintings that adorned Sambo's Pancake House were a retelling of the hugely popular children's book Little Black Sambo. Written by Helen Bannerman a Scottish woman living in India it was published in America in 1900. According to author Phyllis J. Ewell, author of Little Black Sambo, A Closer Look, Little Black Sambo describes a dark-skinned child's adventures with four tigers. Wearing his new set of brightly colored clothes and carrying an umbrella for a walk in the jungle, Sambo finds that he must give each piece of beloved finery to the tigers to keep from being eaten. Jealous over their new possessions and increasingly enraged the tigers discard the clothing and chase each other around a tree so ferociously that they turn to melted butter. While Sambo retrieves his garments the butter is salvaged by Sambo's father Black Jumbo and is used to cook pancakes by Sambo. Sambo's mother Black Mumbo. They are so delicious that Mumbo has 27 Jumbo consumes 45 and Hungry Sambo devours 169. The book became a runaway hit its illustrations becoming more caricatured and offensive with each reprinting. Sambo was often portrayed as a pickaninny and Black Mumbo as an Aunt Jemima. Nominally set in India the story was often reset in Africa or the American South. It appeared on almost every popular children's reading list through the 1940s despite the harmful effects it had on children of all races. As one man in Nebraska recounted in the 1960s.
I sat through Little Black Sambo, and since I was the only black face in the room I became Little Black Sambo. If my parents had taught me bad names to call the Little Cracker Kids and I use that term on purpose to try to get a message across to you you don't like it. Well how do you think we feel when an adult is going to take our child and that adult gives these little white kids bad names to call him? Beginning in the late 1930s some educators began voicing objections to the book being used in classrooms. But all this did not stop Sambo's restaurant's meteoric rise. Helped along by a unique system called a fraction of the action which gave location managers a stake in their restaurant's profits Sambo's began to spring up all over the West. By 1965 there were 40 Sambo's pancake houses serving both Sambo cakes and tiger butter. At the height of the civil rights movement the chain embraced its association with Bannerman's story. Handmade murals by Colonel and Mrs. Hilmer Nelson illustrating the tale were part of the decor of every new location. And that wasn't all, according to Charles Bernstein. Sambo's theme was carried through with the tale of Sambo and the Tiger stressed in the interior decor and on the menus. Sambo and Tiger dolls were sold at each restaurant's cashier stands and every child was given a Sambo's mask upon leaving the restaurant, while Sambo's would claim that its name was derived strictly from a combination of the two founders' names it nevertheless capitalized on the Sambo story. By 1969 it was said that Sambo's was serving enough coffee each day to float a 45-foot yacht. Sambo's restaurants were opening all around the country at a dramatic pace. The chain added 125 new restaurants in 1975 alone. At its peak Sambo's would have 1,117 locations in 47 states. But civil rights leaders and town councils began to object to the restaurant with the racially charged name appearing in their town. In the late 70s protests and lawsuits challenging the Sambo's name were occurring in Virginia, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Ohio and Michigan. The company responded in a remarkably tone-deaf fashion. There's no ground for changing it, Sam Battis Tone Jr. said in response to calls for a name change from the city of Reston, Virginia in 1977. We've operated these family restaurants for 20 years on a 24-hour basis and it's been Sambo's the whole 20 years. The name has been accepted across the country. Bruce Antikani, vice president and general counsel of Sambo's agreed. We are aware of what appears to be the sentiment of a small portion of the people, he said. Our position is that we have 850 restaurants throughout the country 845 of them under the name Sambo's and the problems you can count on one hand. In 1978-79 the growing controversy coincided with the financial collapse of Sambo's due to managerial and structural problems. Remarkably even Sambo's biographer Bernstein sounded an indignant note when describing the chain's self-inflicted woes at this time. As if it didn't have enough trouble Sambo's name in New England and some Midwestern states were repeatedly challenged now by NAACP civil rights groups and indignant consumers. Suddenly people were saying that Sambo's once hailed as a great name was a poor choice. Groups decided they didn't like the connotation of the name from the children's story, Little Black Sambo. Never mind that Sambo's hired a much higher percentage of blacks than most other companies and restaurant firms. Never mind that the name was derived from a combination of the two founders Sam's Sr. and Bonnet, Sambo's was automatically guilty of discrimination in the minds of many under the thinking of that era. While judges generally sided with Sambo's under the banner of the First Amendment the damage in the court of public opinion was done. As one judge said, those who had problems with the chain's name could erect signs carry placards or publish advertisements designed to persuade others to refuse to patronize. That is what freedom of speech is all about. And so they did. Sambo's finally realized the seriousness of the issue and attempted to start an education process to convince consumers Sambo's is anything but racist. They also changed the name of some restaurants in the Northeast and Midwest to No Place Like Sam's and Jolly Tiger, but this did little to rehabilitate their tarnished image.
However it was not protests against the name but financial woes due to company restructuring of the wildly popular fraction of the action scheme which led to Sambos filing for bankruptcy in 1981. That year 450 Sambos closed and the company lost $50 million. By 1984 all the remaining locations had either been sold or shuttered except the original beachside Sambos in Santa Barbara. In late May 2020 George Floyd protests against racism in the United States began in cities across the United States including Santa Barbara. A petition drive asked the owner to change the name of Sambos in June 2020. The name on the original Sambos sign was temporarily changed to the motto Peace and Love. In July 2020 the restaurant was officially renamed to Chad's. Corvettes EJ Corvette's founder Eugene Furkauk began his discounting career in a 400-square-foot loft in mid-Manhattan, New York City. Inventory consisted of well-known brands of luggage household appliances and some jewelry. Discounts were one-third off regular prices. Sales were more than $2,500 per square foot. Furkauk retired in 1968. The company used several retailing innovations to propel its rapid growth. It used discounting even though most discounting was known to be outlawed at the time. Corvettes instituted a membership program a technique from consumers cooperatives that had never been applied to a department store before. It also expanded into suburban locations at a time when most department stores were in central business districts. The record and audio division became an important part of the profits of Corvettes. In 1964 record sales reached $20 million with David Rothfeld merchandise manager for records books and audio equipment described as hard-hitting as the rest of the young driving force behind Corvettes right up to the company's new 37-year-old president Jack Schwadron. Corvette's low-price low-service model was in some ways similar to that of earlier five-and-dime retailers such as Woolworths McCrory's and SS Kresge, but Corvette's was innovative in avoiding the anti-discounting provisions of the Robinson-Patman Act and undercutting the suggested retail price on such expensive items as appliances and luxury pens. Corvettes used membership cards, which it distributed in front of its stores and to surrounding offices, to style itself as a retail cooperative. In doing so Corvettes was able to accept deep discounts from suppliers something that competing department stores such as Macy's and Gimbel's could not do. In fact Macy's and others filed numerous fair trade lawsuits against Corvettes to stop it from undercutting their prices. None succeeded. The lawsuits helped Corvettes by calling attention to prices so low that competitors thought them illegal. Founder Eugene Furkauf attributed his idea for membership cards and deep discounts to luggage wholesaler Chaz W. Wolf. But where Chaz W. Wolf made limited or even surreptitious use of these devices, Corvettes popularized them by instructing employees to distribute membership cards to any person entering any Corvettes. While the first EJ Corvette store was located between 3rd and Lexington Avenues on 45th Street in Manhattan its rapid growth in the 1950s was helped by its many stores in strip malls along arterial roads leading out of urban centers. This made EJ Corvette ideally situated to meet the demands of the suburbs which grew in the United States during that era. The first of the modern type stores was opened in 1954 a 90,000 square foot store in Carl Place on Long Island which for the first time carried apparel. In 1956 Corvettes had six stores including stores in Philadelphia and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. By 1958 it had 12 stores. At its peak it had 58 stores.
a Corvette's retail floor had cashiers located in individual departments without a central checkout area. Large stores included a full supermarket pharmacy pet store and tire center. Corvettes expanded into the Chicago, Northern Virginia, Detroit and St. Louis areas in the 1960s. It successfully disputed the state and local Sunday closing ordinances and laws after a December 20, 1976 internal financial feasibility study created by this contributor then an employee. A copy of that study is still extant in paper form which is available for review independent confirmation and study. Once those barriers were broken many other retailers opened on Sunday. Corvette's decline and closure are variously attributed to inconsistent management failure to focus on merchandise at new, such as appliances, and ultimately attempting to compete directly with the department stores in areas such as fashion, when it had neither the expertise nor the right store atmosphere. In February 1961 Eugene Furkout brought Jack Schwadron in from Alexander's department stores as general merchandise manager of Ready to Wear. Schwadron was elected vice president and named president of Corvettes in 1964. Upon becoming president of Corvette's Schwadron is quoted saying when we went first to Detroit people thought you spelled our name with a C and we were something you drive but after 90 days our customers and our competitors knew exactly who we were and our profitability has been hampered by the rapidity with which we have opened new stores but we have finally been able to build the kind of base from which we can develop profitably into a nationwide company. Of note was E.J. Corvette's venture into the home entertainment business. The retailer established a rather out-of-context series of high-end audio salons within selected stores. Corvette's went so far as to market its own XAM brand of stereo receivers amplifiers, some manufactured by Harman Kardon and Roland, television sets and speakers. XAM was rumored to be a tribute to the owner's deceased dog Max. In June 1965 Schwadron resigned over policy differences including opposing philosophies on merchandising methods of advertising and public relations among others. In late 1965 Corvettes formed its own home furnishings division and ceased subcontracting furniture and carpet sales. A complex warehousing and distribution network was established. A central distribution warehouse was established in Danville, Virginia. This location received furniture purchased by its buyers located in East Patterson, New Jersey and in turn reshipped individual customer orders based on promised delivery dates. The sold merchandise was then shipped to delivery warehouses in East Patterson and Pensacon, New Jersey and Jessup, Maryland for final prep and delivery. The furniture distribution group was active until it closed at the end of 1977. By 1966 Corvettes had begun to decline and chose to merge with Spartan Industries a soft goods retailer. Eugene Furkauf was eased out of the company leadership and Spartan managers attempted to revive the company. From 1971 to 1979 Corvettes was owned by Arlen Realty and Development Corporation a land development company that used Corvettes 50 stores as a source of cash flow. During this period New York area Corvettes stores advertised heavily on local television using game show host Bill Cullen as a spokesman. In 1979 Corvettes was purchased by the Agash Willot Group of France which initially closed Corvettes least profitable stores and began selling off merchandise fixtures equipment and real estate. In 1980 they declared bankruptcy and on December 24, 1980 they closed all of their remaining 17 stores. In the absence of the U.S. Corvette chain in Canada a discount store chain was launched in Quebec in 1958 using the name Corvette Stores Limited without any affiliation to the American company. The chain still exists today and operates 71 discount stores as of May 2015.
Strawbridge and Clothier Strawbridge and Clothier began as a dry goods store founded by Quakers Justice Clayton Strawbridge 1838 to 1911 and Isaac Hollowell Clothier 1837 to 1921 in Philadelphia in 1868 Strawbridge and Clothier purchased the three-story brick building on the northwest corner of Market and 8th Streets in Center City Philadelphia that had been Thomas Jefferson's office from 1790 to 1793 while he served as Secretary of State and opened their first store they soon replaced the old building with one of five stories and then expanded into neighboring buildings as well. In 1928 the company decided to replace all but one of its buildings with a new edifice and began construction in phases on the 13-story building which stands on the corner of Market and North 8th Street today. Designed in the Beaux-Arts style by the Philadelphia architectural firm Simon & Simon the cost of the limestone building was expected to be $6.5 million an amount which caused some concern to the store's owners. By the time of the ribbon cutting in 1931 in the depth of the Great Depression the staggering $10 million cost of such grand construction nearly suffocated the cash strap company. The building subsequently became the Eastern Anchor in 1977 of the Gallery and Urban Mall connecting Strawbridge and Clothier with Gimbals which had relocated from across Market Street to join the mall. It was the vision of S&C Chairman Stockton Strawbridge that was instrumental in revitalizing the Market East Retail District in the 1970s a vision that is still apparent today despite the demise of both Gimbals and Strawbridge. He once said that his goal was to transform fading East Market Street into the champs Elysee of Philadelphia. After successfully fighting off a hostile takeover attempt by Ronald S. Barron in 1986 Strawbridge and Clothier survived as an independent locally owned department store into the 1990s. In 1995 in an attempt to become the dominant retailer in the Philadelphia region S&C partnered with Federated Department Stores Pomeroy's and the Rubin Brothers Real Estate Development Company to acquire their rival Wanamakers but were outbid in bankruptcy court by May Department Stores Company. Subsequently the 13 Strawbridge and and Clothier department stores were themselves bought by May in 1996 when the Strawbridge and Clothier directors, mostly members of the Strawbridge and Clothier families, elected to liquidate operations over the vehement objections of patriarch Stockton Strawbridge. Strawbridge died not long after the sale. He was the store and the store was him, said his attorney Peter Hearn to the Philadelphia Daily News. Store employees and the public at large felt a sense of loss as well. Many employees rushed to pay off their credit card accounts in full before the sale was finalized hoping that the proceeds would go to the founding families rather than the new buyers. After the sale the stores operated simply as Strawbridge's although exterior signage reading Strawbridge and Clothier remained in place at many locations until the stores became Macy's in 2006. May had merged the former John Wanamaker into its hex banner but converted them to Strawbridge's as well, except for Wanamaker's former flagship on Market Street which eventually became a Lord and Taylor and is now Macy's. However the Strawbridge and Clothier head office was closed and its operations were consolidated with hex in Arlington, Virginia. Virginia. In May 1930 Strawbridge and Clothier helped remake the American retail scene by opening one of the first suburban branch department stores in the nation located in the Suburban Square Shopping Center in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. In 1931 it followed with its second suburban satellite store at Jenkintown, Pennsylvania the building for which was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1988. Strawbridge's opened up a number of branch stores throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. These branch stores typically were opened in shopping malls. Prominent stores throughout the Philadelphia area included the stores in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, Ben Salem Township, Pennsylvania, Exton, Pennsylvania, and Wilmington, Delaware. By the 1970s, Strawbridge's had nearly a dozen branch stores in malls across eastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, and northern Delaware. The branches proved to have been a wise step as the flagship store posted only a few years of actual profitability, all of them during the 1940s. The last S&C store built was at Burlington Center mall in 1982.
Some Strawbridge stores had restaurants inside like at Christiana Mall in Newark, Delaware as well as the Strawbridge and Clothier store at Exton Square Mall. The Jenkintown store also had a restaurant. The company also revolutionized retailing with their introduction of revolving charge account cards. Strawbridge's was well known for its handled shopping bags which kept up with the fashion of each era. It was a paper bag with navy blue handles with Strawbridge's printed in blue twice and red once on one side of the bag and vice versa on the other. Once May assumed the company the Strawbridge and Clothier seal of confidence was no longer a prominent marketing image. Late 1970s and 1980s bags were a bright glossy yellow with that era pseudo calligraphic trademark in a vertical orientation in black along the bag's edge. 1960s bags featured a modern script like trademark with their famous seal of confidence. Strawbridge's was also known for its friendly employees. In the center of the flagship store was a large bronze statue of a wild boar a replica of Pietro Tacaz il Porcelino. The legend had it that good luck would follow those who rubbed the boar's nose. The boar consequently had a very shiny nose from all the rubbing. In July 2006 the Pennsylvania Real Estate Investment Trust created owners of the gallery at Market East agreed to purchase the lower floors of the flagship Strawbridge store. Create sought retail tenants for the areas of the building closest to street level and converted some higher floors to office space. The uppermost floors had previously been sold and converted to offices they are currently owned by American Financial Realty Trust of Jenkintown. On February 26, 2009 it was announced that the developers of Foxwoods Casino Philadelphia were looking into locating their new casino on three floors of the former Strawbridge's flagship store currently owned by PREIT. In April 2012 it was reported by one of the subcontractors that the building was undergoing additional renovation for both office and residential use. In July 2012 the Philadelphia Inquirer and Philadelphia Daily News relocated to the third floor of the building from their former headquarters at 400 North Broad Street. Wolko The creation of Woolco coincided with the expansion of suburbia. Woolworth's flagship stores were still doing well, but the company wanted to tap into the growing discount department store market without diluting its dominant position in the variety store business. The first Woolco store was located in Columbus, Ohio in 1962. By 1966 there were 18 in the United States and 9 in Canada. Plans were for 30 stores to be added per year. This led to tremendous growth as over 300 Woolco stores opened up across North North America by the mid-1970s. Some stores were converted from regular Woolworth stores including the location at Westland Mall in West Burlington, Iowa. The company experimented with both Woolco and a more downscale merchandising unit called Worth Mart in the mid-1960s. Woolco was the eventual winner with customers, and the Worth Mart stores were folded into Woolco's store base by the 1970s. At the outset Wilco stores were considered by the company to be promotional department stores with expanded product lines and other amenities not typically found at namesake Woolworth stores. Many locations contained Red Grill restaurants a cafeteria style outlet and the food area sold popcorn real milkshakes and other food. A number of Woolco stores were opened in the United Kingdom during the same period one of which in Bournemouth was the largest store on one floor in Britain. The typical Woolco store was well over 100,000 square feet which was quite large for a discount store of that era. Many of its departments were leased to third-party operators a common practice among early discounters. Starting in the late 1970s Woolworth enacted a cost-saving plan for Woolco that included a reduction in floor space for the largest locations the elimination of most leased departments and an expansion into smaller markets with stores as small as 60,000 square feet. During this period, the excess space inside 
from larger Woolco stores went to a Woolworth-owned off-price clothing retailer called J. Branham which was short for just brand names. By 1979 it became clear that the earlier cost-saving plan would not be enough to save Woolco from failure so Woolworth combined the discount store operating unit with its variety stores and began to close stores in unprofitable markets including Chicago. On September 24, 1982 Woolco announced it would close all of its United States stores. The final Woolco store to have a grand opening in the U.S. was the September 29, 1982 launch of the Bout Louisiana store which was five days after the chain's announcement of closing all stores. Woolco ceased operations in the United States in January 1983 with all 336 stores closing. Woolco's inventory was valued at approximately $1 billion making Woolco liquidation the largest in United States history at the time. However, the Canadian division of approximately 120 stores remained open. In 1982 the British Woolco stores were converted into regular Woolworth stores and were spun off along with the British Woolworths chain in the same year. Those larger stores were subsequently sold by Kingfisher PLC to Gateway in 1986 and then Gateway sold the stores again this time to ESTA in 1988. In 1990, 26 Woolworth stores in Canada were converted to Woolco because of their larger size. On January 14, 1994 in order to repay the $1.7 billion debt incurred from international specialty store expansion the Woolworth Corporation sold most of the Woolco Canada stores to Walmart. Walmart did not acquire the Woolco stores that were either unionized or had downtown locations. Some Woolco stores were sold and reopened as Zeller's stores when Zeller's liquidated some of those stores were later sold to Target Canada which ceased operations themselves in 2015 following bankruptcy. In the UK Kingfisher PLC attempted to revive the style of Woolco with the big W chain in 1999 which was successful but suffered when Woolworths split into its own company in 2001 and in 2004 Woolworths Group PLC scrapped the big W chain and sold some of the stores to supermarket chains Asda and Tesco. Woolworths rebranded the big W stores they kept under their own name and they remained until Woolworths administration in 2008. In a smaller, less crowded retailing market Woolco had a bigger impact in Canada than it did in the US. There were 160 stores in Canada at dissolution the chain having survived another 11 years in Canada after the US closure and before being bought out by Walmart Canada. They were so well known that Canadian songwriters Leon Dubinsky and Max McDonald even wrote a popular song called Working at the Woolco Manager Trainee Blues, 1977. During the 1970s and 1980s the Canadian store were well known for their monthly $1.44 days wherein numerous items were sold at a price of $1.44 CAD. Competitors Woodward's and Eaton's ran $1.49 days usually the first Monday each month. Most stores also contained an automotive and tire service department. Most stores in Canada had an in-store restaurant section. These restaurants were named Red Grill or Strawberry Street Cafeteria except in the province of Quebec where they were named Café Rouge or Moisin d'Or. TGNY Founded in 1935 the chain was headquartered in Oklahoma City and named for the last initials of its three founders Rodden E. Tomlinson Enoch L. Lake Goslin and Raymond A. Young. The three men each owned separate variety stores in Oklahoma when they met at a trade show in 1932. In 1935 the three pooled their financial resources to form the Central Merchandising Corporation and built a warehouse in Oklahoma City allowing their stores to buy merchandise in bulk directly from manufacturers instead of through wholesale. They opened their first jointly owned store in 1936. The owner's initials were ordered according to the ages of the three with Tomlinson being the oldest. Raymond Young the only partner remaining with the chain oversaw operations until his retirement in 1970.
In 1957 TGNY was acquired by Butler Brothers of Chicago with the stipulation that Young's leadership remain unchanged. After Young's retirement leadership changed frequently. By this time there were 127 retail stores. By 1960 the entire TGNY operation had become a wholly owned subsidiary of City Products a Chicago based company which already operated other variety stores. In 1966 Household Finance Corporation HFC acquired City Products. Products. In 1975 David Green left a supervisor job at TGNY to open the second location in what would become the Hobby Lobby chain of arts and crafts stores also based in Oklahoma City. In 1986, when it had about 920 stores TGNY was acquired by competitor McCrory Stores. McCrory was a division of Rapid American Corporation, a holding company that owned several retail chains. At the time Rapid American was solely owned by businessman and money manager Mesh Ulam Rickless. At its peak the chain had nearly 1,000 stores in 29 states from Florida to California. After its heyday in the 1960s unsuccessful attempts were made to expand and rebrand TGNY under the trade names TGNY Dollar Aim for the Best and Dollar T. By March 1986 McCrory announced that it would sell about 200 of the 743 TGNY operations it had so recently acquired. Shortly after acquiring the struggling chain McCrory's cut over 8,000 TGNY employees and closed 205 stores including 23 in its former home state of Oklahoma. While the variety store formats averaged around 15,000 square feet per store there were also larger discount store formats of around 30,000 to 40,000 square feet. Ultimately over 36,000 TGNY employees were displaced. Many went to work for Walmart helping fuel their remarkable growth resulting from TGNY vacating thriving markets. TGNY and Walmart historically avoided locating in the same market and with TGNY stores out of the picture there was no such restraint. Others found employment with Hobby Lobby headed by former TGNY associate David Green. History shows that Walmart and Hobby Lobby both benefited greatly from this. In 2001 TG&Y's owner McCrory Stores filed bankruptcy and all stores were eventually closed. Raymond Young the youngest and last survivor of the three founders died in the same year. In January 2014 the Chisholm Trail Museum of Kingfisher, Oklahoma put on an exhibit commemorating the TGNY chain featuring music merchandise and other displays from its golden era. The Kingfisher store had opened in 1927. Adam Lynn Museum director was evidently surprised by the popularity of the exhibit which had been scheduled to run only through March. He said that over 1,000 former employees from as far away as Kansas and Texas had visited this exhibit which the museum had extended until August of that year. He noted that all the former employees had expressed that they loved working at the store and that they would have continued working there until retirement if the company had not gone out of business. The museum later decided to make the exhibit permanent and won the Leadership in History Award of Merit from the American Association for State and Local History. A former TGNY manager Tom Clinton decided to open a new version of the old store on January 6, 2003 in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. His opportunity arose when he learned in 2001 that the last TGNY had closed. He bought the rights to the company name and a former drug warehouse building which provided 12,000 square feet of space. The new store's emphasis is on craft items and household goods but aisles display food products, toys, pet supplies, stationery, yarn, ceramics, tools and hardware and health and beauty. AIDS. Bradley's.
Bradley's was named for Connecticut's Bradley International Airport where early planning meetings were held by the store's founders. The first store was opened in New London, Connecticut on March 14, 1958. The company was acquired by grocery chain Stop and Shop in 1961 which owned the chain until 1992. In the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area nearly all shopping centers that had Bradley's stores also had a stop and shop in the same plaza or in some cases, connected with the store as a super center but this ended when stop and shop pulled out of the New York area during the 1980s only to come back around 1998 to 1999. Like some of its competition including Caldor many Bradley's stores had snack stands lunch counters that served soft drinks hot dogs french fries soft pretzels ice cream prepackaged cookies and various other food items to shoppers. In 1993 Bradley's added Pizza Hut Taco Bell and Dunkin Donuts items to some of the stores that didn't have snack stands as well as new stores constructed during this time. Bradley's was known for its TV and print ads featuring the character Mrs. B, played by actress Cynthia Harris, depicted as the chain's buyer who constantly searched for bargains to pass on to her customers. The advertising jingle went at Bradley's, you buy what Mrs. B buys, and nobody can buy like Mrs. B. In 1988 its parent company Stop and Shop was involved in a hostile takeover bid by Herbert Hapstart Group. The board of directors appointed Colbert Kravis Roberts and Company to acquire the company shortly after. The deal was completed in 1989 with Stop and Shop becoming a private company. The first major Bradley's store closings came in 1988 when it exited the southern United States. Bradley's remained profitable into the early 1990s. In 1992 a year after its parent company becoming public once again Stop and Shop Incorporated sold Bradley's to an investment group and the chain continued as a separate company. By 1994 the company was unprofitable after attempting to open a bunch of new stores in New Jersey and New York. After losing money for two years Bradley's had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in June 1995 and closed down some underperforming stores including its only two stores in the state of Rhode Island in 1996. Some of these were turned into Ames. James Samberland previously senior vice president of Lazarus Department Stores was appointed as executive vice president of Bradley's on August 25, 1995. The company successfully emerged from bankruptcy in February 1999 after making a decent profit through 1998 and early 1999. Bradley's also took advantage of the liquidation and closure of competitor Caldor shortly after its emergence from bankruptcy and purchased several of its former stores. The fortunes of Bradley's took a turn for the worse in 2000 and on December 26, 2000 the company announced another filing for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection and said that Bradley's would begin liquidation sales as soon as possible ending business. Executives of Bradley's said it filed for bankruptcy protection because of a general economic downturn including rising interest rates and higher gas and heating oil prices that had left customers with less disposable income. The executives also said new competition, unseasonable weather in the first half of 2000 and the tightening of trade credit contributed to its inability to operate profitably. In an interview just before the chain closed analyst Eric Better of Leidenberg Thalman and Co said they really needed a perfect economy to get this thing moved referring to the attempt at recovery after the restructuring of the company. But the recent consumer spending slowdown did not facilitate that environment he said. In early January 2001 the chain started their liquidation sales and the final store closed on March 15, 2001. At the time of its liquidation the company had 10,000 employees and 105 stores in 7 states. Many of its former store locations were purchased by Walmart although other locations became the Home Depot, Foreman Mills, Target, Kohl's, Marshalls, Dollar Tree, ShopRite, or Stop and Shop. Stop and Shop owned much of its real estate even after it spun 
off the company. Stop and Shop was acquired by a hold in 1996 and some former Bradleys were sold to other a hold divisions such as Giant. When the Nasdaq stock market suspended trading in Bradley's stock it closed at just under 22 cents. Pan fruit. The company was founded in 1927 by three Philadelphia merchants Morris Kaplan, Isaac Kaplan and Samuel Cook as a produce store at 52nd and Market Streets in Philadelphia. The store used low prices and heavy promotions to drive sales. The store was so successful that it was soon doing $10,000 a week in sales. The success of that initial store attracted John McClatchy a local builder, to commission the young company to build a produce and seafood store in what would be Philadelphia's first shopping center. By the early 1930s the company had grown to six stores and although it did not want to add a full line of groceries to its fair competition from established chains like Acme and A&P forced it into the grocery business. However unlike the bigger chains, the company was so successful that it could easily transition its chain from smaller stores to larger supermarkets. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s Penfruit expanded its older stores and added new ones throughout Greater Philadelphia and New Jersey. It eventually added fresh meat departments to its stores and became one of the first chains to sell floral items. Because of its discount format and clean high-volume self-service stores the company was very popular in and around its core Philadelphia-slash-New Jersey market. After World War II and throughout the 1950s the company expanded its territory opening stores in both New York and Baltimore however the company was less than successful with these stores partly because of their geographic distance from Philadelphia. Stores built in the 1950s had a distinctive design topped by a wide sweeping arch roof. Some of these buildings are still in use today. In 2016, the former Penfruit store on Frankfurt Avenue one of the last with an intact arch design was recommended and approved for city landmark status. In the 1960s the company diversified establishing chains of garden stores, gaudios, discount drug stores and convenience food stores buying a chain of Baltimore area supermarkets as well as a toy chain called Kitty City. But the company's greatest success was in its core business supermarkets. In 1964 the company launched a chain of discount supermarkets called Dales and three years later opened the first in a chain of consumers warehouse markets most if not all of Dales and CWM stores were rebrandings of existing Penfruit stores. By 1971 the company had nearly 80 stores and sales of $370 million. However rivals such as A&P Food Fair, later known as Pantry Pride, and Acme were opening discount stores of their own and in 1973 Acme's 173 Philadelphia area stores launched a price war against Penfruit's 12 warehouse markets. This move set off a series of events that would lead to the latter's downfall. After nearly two years the bottom fell out. Penfruit, unable to compete, filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy and began selling off most of its non-supermarket holdings. It then later closed all but a handful of its supermarkets including the last of its Baltimore division, now called Big Value, which were sold to Food A Rama a local Baltimore chain, now part of Shoppers Food and Pharmacy a Super Value division, with the remaining 17 stores sold to Food Fair in 1975. Some of the former Penfruit stores became shop and bag stores an old chain of owner-operated cooperative business model. Penfruit continued as a division of Pantry Pride until the latter filed bankruptcy two years later with those units being absorbed by a variety of competitors.
If you have any fond memories, please indicate it at the comments below. Thanks for watching, subscribe and like.